All right, we are live. Hello. Hello. Yeah, it's 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 starting now. So here we are. And it looks like the chat is already not updating. Chat, come back to me. There we go. Mad King Aries. Hello, folks. This was going to be the much anticipated Tywin Lannister beheading. <laughs> I'm sorry. Non-biased character analysis of Tywin Lannister. Off with his head. Uh, but I realized that we have to talk about Aries before we can talk Tywin because Tywin's entire life is shaped by Aries. So, here we are. What we're actually going to be doing is reading from one of my favorite books. It's called The World of Ice and Fire, and it's a little bit slept on. Everyone knows it exists, but it's actually a lot fun to read. Yes, I did, devoted to Mariah. Yes, I did. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, 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 the World of Ice and Fire is awesome. It is well-written. It is lots of fun. It has the Great Empire of the Dawn. It's got all kinds of stuff. And the section on Ares' reign has a lot. It has a lot. It's pretty long. And it's got a whole bunch of stuff about young Tywin and basically all the history that sets up the main action of the story. Um, so it's going to be, uh, it's going to run up to Robert's Rebellion. And basically Ares is king from three years after Summerhall until Robert's Rebellion. So... Okay, everyone's... Okay, the, there's buffering and choppiness. I don't know why that is. Um, I'm not in control of that. Try refreshing the... I, bloody hell, guys. I don't know what to tell you. Um, sometimes the first couple minutes are a little funky as it buffers, I guess, or something. It's not there on the rewatch, so I've, I've got to keep rolling with the stream. And uh, hopefully it'll catch up for you guys. But uh, okay, it's stabilizing. I guess I just, I don't know, came out late and the YouTube is like, what's going on? There you go. All we needed to do was talk about it, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> so uh, yeah, okay. So here we go. We're going to basically go through the reign of King Ares. Now, as I said, King Ares becomes king three years after Summerhall. So we're actually going to start with his father, Jaehaerys II, because that's really short. It's like two pages, um, but that will set the stage for Ares. So basically what we're going to do is this week we're going to go through Ares' reign up to Robert's Rebellion. Um, two weeks from now, we're going to do Tywin. And then after that, I, I'm trying to schedule a special guest to do a Robert's Rebellion detailed breakdown like a military breakdown of where all the troop movements and all the battles and stuff we're gonna do something like that so uh yeah so this is what one of the things we're doing and then um next week we're gonna do the ironborn the next ironborn video that i was gonna do as a produced video we're gonna do it as a me and gray waste tim discussion because the nature of the material lends itself it's got i'm opening up I made some big discoveries about the Ironborn, but it opens up more fodder for discussion. So I feel like instead of a scripted thing where I'm just coming at you, I'm going to have Grey Waste Tim on, and we're going to talk about uh, all the cultural buildup that George has done. But I don't want to get lost on the Ironborn today. We're doing Aries today, but that's the next three weeks. So we're Aries today, Ironborn, uh, Driftwood Kings next week, and then it will be Robert's Rebellion. I'm sorry, then uh, Tywin, the beheading of Tywin. Then Robert's Rebellion. There we go. So, <clears throat> and there will be Rhaegar commercials somewhere in there, as we know. The next Rhaegar commercial is going to be so funny, you guys. I will have a video go, uh, coming out this week, by the way, on Tuesday. I went back to the cool chart that I made, and I did a lot more with it. So I've got a produced chart video, total eclipse of the chart. It's coming. All right, so let's... Get right into this. This is, again, Jaehaerys II, the father of Mad King Ares. So this is the beginning of Ares' story, really. And as always, you can support the program with a super chat, which you can do inside of YouTube, or, even better, with the PayPal link in the description below the video. And you can attach a question uh, to the PayPal in the comments field, 
and I will see it and answer it in due course. So the tragedy of Summer Hall, folks, brought Jaehaerys, second of his name, to the Iron Throne in 259 AC. Scarcely had he donned the crown than the Seven Kingdoms found themselves plunged into war, for the Nine Penny Kings had taken and sacked the free city of Tyrosh and seized the Stepstones. From there, they stood poised to attack Westeros. And we'll come back for these kings in a second. Jaehaerys had known that the Band of Nine meant to win the Seven Kingdoms for Maelys the Monstrous, who had declared himself King Maelys the First Blackfire. But like his father Aegon, Jaehaerys had hoped the Alliance of the Rogues would founder in Essos or fall at the hands of some alliance amongst the free cities. Now the moment was at hand, and King Aegon V was gone. That's Egg, of course. As was the Prince of Dragonflies, Prince Daeron, that splendid knight, had died years before, leaving only Jaehaerys the least marshal of Aegon's three sons. The new king was four and thirty, thirty-four, when he ascended the throne. No one would have called him formidable. Unlike his brothers, Jaehaerys II was thin and scrawny and had battled various ailments all his life. Aww. Well, as we know, thin people can't contribute to society or be, you know, competent rulers, so... Feel attacked! <laughs> I'm not sickly, I'm just skinny. Anyway... <laughs> um, let's see. Yet he did not lack for courage or intelligence. Drawing on his father's plans, his grace put aside his grief, called his lord's bannermen, and resolved to meet the nine penny kings upon the stepstones, choosing to take the war to them, rather than awaiting their landing on the shores of the seven kingdoms. So that's pretty good. King Jaehaerys had intended to lead the attack upon the nine penny kings himself, but his hand, Lord Ormond Baratheon, persuaded him. Uh, why did that happen? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. It just jumped places wildly. What the? I just downloaded the new Kindle app, and it really likes to jump places, I have noticed. Hopefully this... I don't even know how that happened. Okay. His hand, Lord Ormond Baratheon, persuaded him that that would be unwise. The king was unused to the rigors of campaign and not unused and not skilled in arms, the hand pointed out. So it would be folly to risk losing him in battle so soon after the tragedy of Summerhall. And that is, that is true. Jaehaerys finally, because you have to remember, there's a lot fewer Targaryens now. There's not so many cousins and backup uh, silver-haired people to sit on the throne, so... Uh, Jaehaerys finally allowed himself to be persuaded to remain at King's Landing with his queen. Command of the host was given to Lord Ormond as King's Hand. In 260, his lordship landed Targaryen armies upon the Three of the Stepstones. The War of the Nine Penny Kings turned bloody. Battle raged across the islands and channels for most of a year. Maester Eon's account of the War of the Nine Penny Kings, one of the finest works of its kind, is a splendid source, blah, blah, blah. And I will be skipping through a little bits that aren't super... Aries centric but the bottom line is that um, Lord Ormond was amongst the first to perish he was cut down by Maelys the Monstrous and he died in the arms of his son and heir Stephen Baratheon who is of course Stannis and Robert and Renly's father so he's an important figure to keep track of command of the Targaryen host now passed to the new young Lord Commander of the Kingsguard Sir Gerald Hightower the White Bull Hightower and his men were hard-pressed for a time, but as the war hung in the balance, a young knight named Sir Barristan Selmy slew Maelys in single combat, winning undying renown and deciding the issue in a stroke, for the remainder of the Nine Penny Kings had little or no interest in Westeros and soon fell back to their own domains. Maelys the Monstrous was the fifth and last of the Blackfire pretenders. That's right, because there's, there's no more Blackfire rebellions coming. Definitely not. My name is Fagon. I'm carrying black steel. It's coming. Check out our Fagon stream. Which was demonetized by YouTube. The, the YouTube, they sent out three different notifications saying they were loosening their standards. And I've had more live streams demonetized in the last month. You know, war is peace, up is down. That's cool. Anyway, 
Love y'all. Thank you for your support. My name is Fagon. Yep, that Six Black Fire Rebellion is coming. Anyways, yes, the last, the last. Let's see, where are we? Um, With his own death, the curse that Aegon the Unworthy had inflicted on the Seven Kingdoms by giving his sword to his bastard son was finally ended. That's right. Blackfire definitely can't be in the hands of the Blackfires because we know, oh, wait, it's missing. Last scene with the Blackfires. Oh. Yeah, it's in Illyrio's chests. It's not his chest, like, um, the chest that he sent with John Connington. Have the ginger candy. That's why the ginger candy line is in the Fagon song. Hum diddy. We got a, we got a PayPal. Look at that. 420 PayPal. It's like people know the themes around here. Thank you. Kelly Johnson. With the Mad Queen Danny question. I can't answer that today, Kelly. That's too much of a digression. You know what? I'll try to fit when we talk about Aries's madness, I'll try to I'll try to come back to a little Danny commentary. I do think, yeah, no, she's gonna she'll be tempted and stuff. I'm not saying <laughs> Lucy Jane McGaw uh, says, Morning, Professor Lightbringer. Look forward to the session. Thank you. All right, so Half a year of hard fighting remained. D to D to D, Archon of Tyrosh, something, something. Uh, the realm thereafter returned to peace. Though never strong, Jerry's the second proved to be a capable king. Oh, it's the weak and scrawny guy, capable king. Met the rebellion on before it could get to Westeros and snuffed it out. That's anyway. Restoring order to the Seven Kingdoms and reconciling many of the great houses who had grown unhappy with the Iron Throne because of King Aegon V's attempted reforms. Hey, not bad. So remember. Our boy Egg was a man of the people. And one of the reasons why he wanted dragons, supposedly, was to enforce his reforms, which were basically pro people they're good for those small folk and rolled back the uh you know privileges of the high lords a little bit here and there and that did generate uh, obviously unrest some of the high lords didn't like having to be nicer to their peons and serfs and things and so that was a point of tension that jaharis the second is inheriting and what's interesting here is that he is able to reconcile some of these great houses. It does not say that he reversed Aegon's reforms. That is coming later. It is Tywin, that mofo Tywin, who reverses the pro-small uh, folk reforms. It is not Jaehaerys II. But it's interesting that he is managing to reconcile, it's, quote, many of the great houses without reversing those reforms. So, pretty skilled king, seems like, actually. Despite his scrawny, sickly nature. Anyway. Um, unfortunately, the reign proved to be a short one. In 262, King Jaehaerys II sickened and died abed after a short illness, complaining of a sudden shortness of breath. He was but 37 years of age at his passing and had sat the Iron Throne for a scarce three years. So, the guy that was always sickly got sick and died, or the person that was murdered by the Maesters was written to be more sick than he was, so it wouldn't seem suspicious. But, who knows, really. Doesn't matter. He died, that's the point. Only three years did he reign. Oh, look, it's Barristan and Maley's illustration credit 80. Oh, that's why not just put the guy's name right there. This is so dumb. Oh, <laughs> let's look for the 80. Where is it? It's around here somewhere. <laughs> Fucking Kindle. Um, Dean uh, Pres Presetia 
right there. Uh, so now how do we... Uh, this is a nightmare. <laughs> this fucking Kindle. Jesus Christ. Oh, where is it? Um... Sorry, like I said, they made me update it this morning, and I'm not used to how this works. And it apparently likes to jump around on its own quite a bit. Okay. There's the picture. Hey, there's the next page. It's nice. Nice when the next page comes after the last page. Found your channel last week, and man, I am glad. I won't throw out just saying thanks. Hey, glad to see you, Siaran. Did Valerian die of old age, in my opinion? Yep. Seems so. Yeah, he was slowing down for a while. It doesn't I don't think he was poisoned. Seems like the dragons do get do die eventually. It seems like they do get old. They're not they're not eternal like the weirwoods. All right, so Ares the second, the second of his name, Ares Targaryen, was but 18 years of age when he ascended the Iron Throne in 262 AC upon the death of his father, Jaehaerys, after little more than three years of rule. A handsome youth, Ares had fought gallantly in the Stepstones during the War of the Nine Penny Kings, though not the most diligent of princes, nor the most intelligent. He had... <laughs> Damn, dude. He had an undeniable charm that won him many friends. He was also vain, proud, and changeable, traits that made him easy prey for flatterers and lickspittles but these flaws were not immediately apparent to most at the time of his ascension. Until the Duskendale situation, Ares II seemed like just another bad king. Is that right? Well, Gabe, that's kind of one of the big discussion points here. Because, you know, there's a saying, power corrupts, right? And then the next, the sort of galaxy brain version of that is, well, power reveals, reveals your true nature. And the truth is, it's actually both. Um, the more power you get, it can act as a corrupting influence. And the closer you get to absolute power, where people are afraid to question you, you don't have a boss, you know, um, that is a corrupting influence. But I do think that the other one is probably more true. Like the things that are lurking there in your nature, when you're become rich or powerful it's like you kind of get to see what does someone really want to do if they have the ability to and sometimes that answer is charity and you know building basketball courts for kids in their neighborhood or sometimes it's something much darker <laughs> and there was that guy in florida who built like strange stone monuments that Nobody understands how he built them. A Coral Gables guy. That's that's what I'd be like if I got rich. <laughs> now nah, we're just getting started, Jenny. Just getting started. So, Ron Robinson, couldn't all these events be tied to the Maester conspiracy and the loss of the dragons? Maybe. I'm not seeing a ton of clues about that. I just sort of threw it out. But the dragons are already gone at this point. So if that's the main... That's how I always think about the Maester conspiracy is like an attempt to get rid of the dragons, right? So the dragons are gone at this point. I don't know that... Like, why assassinate Jaehaerys? He was a peaceful ruler who was steadying the kingdom. So, yeah. I don't I don't tend to think Jaehaerys' death would, would is super suspicious, really. Was he really capable? Selmy compares his weakness to his dar in A Dance of Dragons. I don't know what you mean, Kelly. Can you clarify for me? Is who capable of what? Barristan is very capable in war. Oh, are you talking about Jaehaerys the Second? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'd have to go find that quote. I don't remember that quote. But really, we're focusing on Ares, so. Yeah, Ares did do a few things wrong. No, he did. 
But I guess the point is, um, to answer the question, as we read through this, we're going to be watching for signs of Aries's sort of personality. And I do have a take on like what he was like before Duskendale. And obviously he comes out of Duskendale traumatized and stuff, you know. Um, but I think there's no question that Aries has written to be someone that's mentally unstable, uh, if you want to say. We can sort of speculate about what conditions Martin might be imagining him to have or something like that. But there's definitely, he's very mercurial. You know, he has all these different ideas that he gets into and then abandons. Almost like a person with ADHD going, I know, let's do this. Let's build a wall. Let's do that. And I obviously am a person with ADHD, so not not insulting anybody. But yeah, it almost seems kind of like that. He's very emotional. There's definitely some rage issues. Um, so yeah, there's, I think there's definitely some signs of instability, but this is also a maester account that is written very, very pro Tywin. Okay. Um, you will see by the end of this, like this thing is written super duper pro Tywin. And it's probably a lot of Pycelle's influence on all these stories. Like Pycelle didn't write this, but he was the grand maester that was close to all these points. And so this whole, you know, Citadel narrative uh, is going to be framed a lot by Pycelle, who was a Tywin fanboy, number one. Absolutely. He's got shirtless Tywin posters on his wall. There's no doubt. <laughs> so, um, no, we don't all have ADHD, Violet Dragon. Some people actually do have ADHD. However, Society as a whole is steering people towards shorter attention spans, which is maybe what you're sort of referring to. Um, so in that sense, our collective attention span is being shortened by media and stuff. But ADHD is a very real and distinct thing that you either, you know, have or don't have. Of course, everything's on a spectrum. But if you're messing with ADHD, then you know what that's about. Anyways... Ares, so where were we? Let's see. Not even the wisest could have known that Ares II would in time be known as the Mad King, nor that his reign would ultimately put an end to near three centuries of Targaryen rule in Westeros. Yet even as Ares donned his crown in that fateful year of 262 AC, let me just highlight the dates. Robert's Rebellion is 281 that it begins, I believe. So... We've got about a 20-year window that we're talking about. Heron Hall was 250... I'm sorry, Summer Hall was 259. And so here we are three years later in 262. Even as Ares donned his crown, let's see, a lusty black-haired son named Robert had just been born to his cousin Stephen Baratheon and his lady wife at Storm's End, whilst far to the north at Winterfell, Lord Rickard Stark celebrated the birth of his own son, Brandon. So, another Stark, Eddard. Eddard Stark followed within a year. All three of these infants would, in the fullness of time, play crucial roles in the downfall of the dragons. Lusty baby, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a more antiquated use of lusty. Not like lust, lust. I mean like robust. You know, that's all. Uh, like uh, the child that you would hope to have. If you had a child, you want it to be... I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> I don't want children, so... Whatever whatever people with children want their children to look like. So the new king had already provided the realm with an heir in the person of his son Rhaegar, born amongst the flames of Summerhall. Ares and his queen, his sister Rhaella, were young, and it was anticipated that they would have many more children. This was a vital question at the time, for the tragedies of Aegon the Unlikely's reign had trimmed the noble tree of House Targaryen down to just a lonely, a pair of lonely branches. Okay, so Rhaegar born in 259. So Rhaegar is three and Ares is 18 when Ares takes the throne. And Rhaella would be a year or two younger, 16 or 17. And then, of course, Stefan Baratheon is Ares's cousin. 
uh, because one of Egg's daughters married Ormond Baratheon. So Aerys II did not lack for ambition, folks. Upon his coronation, he declared that it was his wish to be the greatest king in the history of the Seven Kingdoms. A conceit certain of his friends encouraged by suggesting that one day he might be remembered as Aerys the Wise or even Aerys the Great. So right there, that tells you something. Um, he's not coming to the throne with like this sense of, oh my God, what a crushing responsibility. He's like, I shall be Ares the Great, the greatest king ever in Westeros. So he's kind of got a little dreamy sort of delusions of grandeur thing going on here. Supposedly, you know. Where did Ares burn them all obsessions originate? Could it have been from the same source as Danny's dragon dreams? Absolutely, Jamie. We're going to talk about that. I definitely believe that Ares was having dragon dreams. And I don't need to door dash for Red Bull. I've got plenty today. <laughs> yes, I do think Ares was having prophetic dreams uh, and that an unstable person having prophetic dreams is like a bad combination. It's not that the dreams drove him mad, but we can see he's already got delusions of grandeur. He is, um, he likes flattery and balls and excitement, you know, so a little bit unstable, very colorful, a little centric. And again, none of these traits are necessarily bad things. We're just sort of piling them up to build a picture of the character. All right, so, Ares, okay, did not like for ambition. His father's court had been made up largely of older seasoned men many of whom had served during the reign of King Aegon V. Which was, okay, that's King Aeg, right? So, prior to 259 AC, essentially. Ares II dismissed them one and all, replacing them with lords of his own generation. Most notably, he retired the aged and exceedingly cautious hand, Edgar Sloane, and named in his place Sir Tywin Lannister, the heir to Casterly Rock. At 20 years of age, so two years older than Ares, Sir Tywin thus became the youngest hand in the history of the Seven Kingdoms. Many maesters to this day insist that his appointment was the wisest thing that, quote, Ares the Wise ever did. <clears throat> yeah, schizophrenia, that's one that people have mentioned with Ares as a possibility. You know, and as always, whenever we talk about doing mental health assessments of fictional characters, I think it's okay to do as long as we keep a grain of salt with it. Um, everybody's interpretation of a character is valid, meaning like if you, part of your lived experience, uh, you can relate, you can find similarities and relate to uh, a character in the story because of that. That's valid. I think it's interesting to sort of look at it and speculate. I just think that there, there should always be some caution at the same, you know, we don't know if Martin is meaning to assign a specific condition to a character. Uh, but I do think that authors nowadays, when they write people that are crazy or unstable, they're not just saying, oh, this person's crazy. They're going to do crazy stuff. It's like, there's a little more thought to it than that. With Aries, we see that there are certain traits and then there's a big source of trauma. And after that trauma, whatever's going on with him very much flowers into full bloom. So that's kind of how I feel about that. But yeah, feel free in the chat, talk about whatever. It's fine. Uh, I think that's all valid. And let's see here. So Ares and Tywin had known each other since childhood. As a boy, Tywin Lannister served as a royal page at King's Landing. He and Prince Ares, together with a younger page, the prince's cousin Stephen Baratheon, had become inseparable. Ah, so there's a, there are threesome. During the War of... Ed, sorry. You know, three, three buddy pals. Take it how you want. He and Prince Ares together... Okay, I said that. During the War of the Nine Penny Kings, the three friends had fought together Tywin as a new-made knight, Stefan and Prince Ares as squires. 
Prince Aries won his Spurs at 6 and 10, or when Prince Aries won his Spurs at 6 and 10, it was to Sir Tywin that he granted the single honor of dubbing him a knight. In 261 AC, Tywin Lannister had proved his prowess as a commander. When he put down an uprising by two of his father's most powerful vassals, the Lords Tarbeck and Rain, extinguishing both of their ancient houses in the process. Though the brutality of his methods drew censure from some, none could dispute that Sir Tywin restored order to the Westerlands after the chaos and conflict of his father's rule. Well, that's a beautiful piece of writing, isn't it? <laughs> Let's just absorb that for a second. Of course, that's the reigns of Castamere that they're talking about. So this is kind of one of the things we're going to get into with Tywin, which we also discussed with Magor, which is there's a certain type of person out there that fetishes, fetishizes brutality. And there are certain people that read the story and they see these brutal characters and they're like, see, that's how you got to do it. Okay. Please notice that Tywin and Magor have two of the most humiliating deaths in the story. Tywin murdered by his own son on the toilet, then stinks up his whole funeral with the smell of shit. Magor dies bleeding on the Iron Throne, abandoned and betrayed by everyone with his own sword stolen out of his scabbard right under his nose by a girl. <laughs> so this is something that I will mostly save for the Tywin stream. But it's interesting the, the maesters are giving us this sort of psychopathic point of view. Be like, well, the methods were a little brutal, but none can doubt that he restored order. And he, everyone knew that he had battle prowess. It's like Tywin is a mass murderer and a psychopath who just extinguished to a man, two vassal houses, man, woman, and child. That's a genocide. Like, if you extinguish an entire house, Magor uh, did that to House Haraway. That's basically a, a genocide in Westeros. So, two, the, his, two of his vassal houses, he didn't put down the rebellion. He massacred every man, woman, and child. So, just to be clear about what that paragraph just sort of glossed over, that's... Whoa, that's some wild stuff that, yeah, you got to take a pause with that. In fact, let me just hit you with some music for like 30 seconds and I'll be right with you. That did not go right. Sorry, you didn't hear. You missed part of the music. I apologize. I'm not sure why that happened. Uh, it came in, though, right? After a second. Reading Rhaegar. Reading Rhaegar. Uh, you were saying the Maesters were playing up Tywin's story. Do you think this means that they were hoping Tywin would, su would succeed Ares' death? Do you think they were surprised by Robert's succession? No. I think this is Picel revisionism. Um, again, I don't see a big maester conspiracy angle on this part of the story. If I if I if something catches my eye, I'll say something. But I listened to this whole passage yesterday. I didn't really hear any clues about that. Now, when you read the Dance of the Dragons, that's I feel like there's a lot of things that are suggesting that we look at that. So it, it doesn't feel quite like that to me. All right, so known each other since Tywin, three friends, 
None could dispute Tywin restored order. Yes, yes, yes. Aerys Targaryen and Tywin Lannister made for an unlikely partnership, it must be said. And by the way, Tywin isn't even Lord of... Yeah, he's not even Lord of Casterly Rock. His father is still alive. So this is not even Tywin fully empowered as the head of his house. He was just like, let me go handle this. And then he, that's what he did. So he's like 20 at this point. 20. Can you imagine being 20? And just... <laughs> Okay, so Ares Targaryen and Tywin Lannister made for an unlikely partnership, it must be said. The young king was lively and active in the early years of his reign. He loved music and dancing. Why does he... This is the worst. The worst. I'm so sorry, guys. You see what's going on here. Like, I'm just pressing the next page. And sometimes it's. Just skipping to the appendix for some reason, man, I wish I knew why I was doing that. It's depressing. It really is. You guys are seeing this, right? I'm not, I don't. I guess I have to hit this little arrow exactly. If I click right above the arrow, it goes to the appendix. So that must be a feature that people want. Okay. Um, and now this. Okay. I struggle with technology, guys. I really do. Like, now the little side arrow is gone. So if I click this, is that going to. Okay. So now it's working. And now it's zoomed in. Oh. I'll be right back, guys. Hi, good girl. Cleo's a little wet. She took a shower this morning, but she's here. She's she's now an emotional support parent. Oh, hi, good girl. Hi, hi. My Kindle's being a it's being a you know what. Yeah. My pretty. There she is. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and we're happy, and we're gonna read this. Can I use the arrow? Yes, I can use... Oh, I'm using the arrow. Okay, we're using the arrow. I think this will work, guys. Okay. Um, he loved music and dancing and masked balls and probably parrots and was exceedingly fond of young women. Oh. Filling his court with fair maidens from every corner of the realm. And let's go back to the dismissal of all the experienced people. Um... There is something to be said for having people around you that are loyal. Um, cleaning house, okay? We saw that with, um, you know, when, when Robert took over, he probably should have gotten rid of Varys, okay? He didn't. Um, that turned out to be a mistake. So, Jaehaerys II comes in and cleans house, yes. But did he really need to dismiss all of his father's servants, every single one, that might have been a little overkill, right? Like, um, maybe keep a few experienced people on for a couple of years while you bring the new people in. It's just a very, I mean, it's just an extreme thing to do. That is what I'm trying to say. 
to fire everyone and put in all new people that are loyal to you. That's like, it's kind of psycho. You know, it's it's very extreme. Let's put it that put it that way. It's very extreme. It's also a little bit hubristic. It's like, oh no, I don't have anything to learn from the people who are already here. I'm going to come in with all of my young, these old people don't know anything. You know, they need to go. And we're, you know, we just need a bunch of young people in here. So, yeah, I think some of this stuff, like when the maester is like, oh, he was a little bit this way or a little bit that way. Like maybe, maybe not. But these actions definitely happened. So I think we can look at something like Ares dismissing all of his father's. And remember, Jaehaerys II had only ruled for three years. Yeah, he drained the swamp. Yes, that's right. But his father had only been ruling for three years. And he had already had a chance to work with some of these people from the previous reign and appoint some people and was doing a pretty good job. Remember, Jaehaerys II was mending the relations with the great houses that were a little pissed off about what Aegon V was doing. So some of that uh, conciliation, if you will, that Jaehaerys II was doing would have been done through his hand and his various assistants and underlings who then all got fired. So in comes Ares and Tywin with a totally new agenda. And this is another thing like, there's no continuity there. You're not giving the other high lords of the realm the feeling that things are on the rails. You're like, oh, the new king just fired everyone. Like when you hear that as a merchant or a lord or something in the realm, you're like, oh, geez, he fired everyone? Wasn't Jaehaerys doing a good job? Like, it's a red flag. And yes, Ron, it could be a sign of paranoia specifically. Good point. Good point. Because we definitely see a lot of paranoia in Ares' life later on. So that's probably a good observation there. Um, somebody else asking about Balerion, unless I'm seeing the same one again. Uh, yeah, I think he did die of old age. Let's see here. So... Oh, let's get to the follies. So as they were saying, we got we've got um fond of women, right? <clears throat> Some say he had as many mis oh yes, filling his court with fair maidens from every corner of the realm. So that kind of tells you like how do you how does a king fill his court with fair maidens? Well, you kind of show a preference for fair maidens and then the lords start bringing them to curry favor with you. That's mostly how that happens. Because people are always trying to curry favor with the king. Um, and yeah, so once it gets out that like he has a taste for philandering, and remember he's married, so this is starting early. As some say he had as many mistresses as Aegon the Unworthy, a most unlikely assertion given all we know of that monarch. Unlike Aegon IV, however, Ares II always seemed to lose interest in his lovers quickly. Yeah, Aegon the Unworthy would get obsessed with people and then, like, turn against, turn against, you know, the houses of, of the brides that he had and stuff. I kind of like Magor. Many lasted no longer than a fortnight, and few as long as half a year. His grace was full of grand schemes as well. Not long after his coronation, he announced his intent to conquer the Stepstones and make them a part of his realm for all time. In 264 AC, a visit to King's Landing by Lord Rickard Stark of Winterfell awakened his interest in the North, and he hatched a plan to build a new wall a hundred leagues north of the existing one and claim all the lands in between. So these first two ideas, he wants to expand the realm, the Stepstones, and north of the wall. But we never hear anything else of that. So this was just something that he said one day and then never did, I guess. Maybe they had one planning meeting and then he forgot about it. I don't know. Uh, let's see, in 267, oh no, in 265, offended by, quote, the stink of King's Landing, he spoke of building a white city entirely of marble on the south bank of the Blackwater Rush. 
In 267 AC, after a dispute with the Iron Bank of Bravos regarding certain monies borrowed by his father, he announced that he would build the largest war fleet in the history of the world to bring the Titan to his knees. In 270 AC, during a visit to Sunspear, he told the Princess of Dorne that he would, quote, make the Dornish deserts One moment. bloom by digging a great underground canal beneath the mountains to bring water down from the rainwood. None of these grand, grandiose plans ever came to fruition. Most, indeed, were forgotten within a moon's turn for Ares II seemed to grow bored with his royal enthusiasms as quickly as he did his royal paramours. And yet, the Seven Kingdoms prospered greatly during the first decade of his reign, for the king's hand was all that the king was not, diligent, decisive, tireless, fiercely intelligent, just, and stern. Okay, so... <laughs> That's Tywin Lannister we're talking about. Um, let's go through those descriptors. Diligent. Yes, one might say obsessive, uh, decisive, one might say psychopathic, but yes, tireless, again, obsessive, um, with an inferiority complex that does not ever quit, <laughs> fiercely intelligent, we'll give him that, a certain medium cunning, okay, not wisdom, but intelligence. Just is the one that makes me guffaw. We're calling him just here after the reigns of Castamir. So, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. He killed innocent women and children in order to put down a rebellion. And when you really get down to it, that's just impatience and laziness. Like, that's a situation that required handling. Yeah, it takes work. Yeah, maybe a couple people got to be executed. Other people have to be negotiated with. You might have to make marriage packs. You might have to go back and forth. But instead, he just sealed up their minds and killed everyone. It was like, problem solved, moving on. Okay? So that is not just in any sense. That's not just in medieval law or anything else. That's just butchery. Anyway. Oh, man. The gods made and shaped this man to rule, Grand Maester Pycelle wrote of Tywin Lannister in a letter to the Citadel after serving with him on the small council for two years. Uh, uh, and rule he did, as the king's own behavior grew increasingly erratic. More and more, the day-to-day -day running of the realm fell to his hand. The realm prospered under Tywin Lannister's stewardship, so much that King Aerys' endless caprices did not seem so portentous. Many Targaryens before him had, had exhibited similar behavior without great cause for concern. I don't know what he's talking about there, really. Um, the only one that was really crazy was Magor, and he was demonstrably crazy and that was a huge problem i can't remember any previous kings that like talk about doing this and doing that the only one that is similar is uh, Aegon the unworthy he tried to build those wildfire and wood dragons basically war machines uh to go conquer dorne and ended up burning down a quarter of the rainwood instead but apart from that, this seems to be a little bit of uh, hearsay. Revisionist history. Because remember that whole all the gods flip a coin thing, that's not factual. You can go through the 70-some Targaryen monarchs and princes and princes that we have. There's like four or five that you could argue are like unstable or crazy. So it's not... Any kind of 50-50 thing, that's that's absolute rubbish. Um, so, or it's just something that people say, essentially. Suggestion, fundraise a commission for new musical composition. Um, uh, um, I'm always working on new stuff. I don't need any fundraising. I'm definitely always working on music. I've just been making uh, videos more lately, but I appreciate you. So... 
From Old Town to the Wall, men began to say that Ares might wear the crown, but it was Tywin Lannister who ruled the realm. It was Tywin Lannister who settled the crown's dispute with the Bravosi, though without making the Titan kneel, quote-unquote, to the king's displeasure, by repaying the monies lent to Jaehaerys II with gold from Casterly Rock, thereby taking debts upon himself. Tywin won the approbation of many great lords by repealing what remained of the laws Aegon V had enacted to curb their powers. Ty- so, there you go. Tywin is like, I know how to make this peaceful. We'll just do away with the reforms because the small folk. Cool. Cool story. Tywin reduced tariffs and taxes on shipping going in and out of the cities of King's Landing, Lannisport, and Old Town, winning the support of many wealthy merchants. Tywin built new roads and repaired old ones, held many splendid tournaments about the realm to the delight of knights and commons both, cultivated trade with the free cities, and sternly punished bakers, found guilty of adding sawdust to their bread, and butchers selling horse meat as beef, okay. In all these efforts... He was greatly aided by Grand Maester Pycelle, whose accounts of the reign of Ares II give us our best portrait of these times. So there you go. Most of this information is coming from Pycelle, who again, just hangs off of Tywin's nuts perpetually. So I'll just say that. Okay. Um, Yet despite these accomplishments, Tywin Lannister was little loved. I wonder why. His rivals charged that he was humorless, unforgiving, unbending, proud, and cruel. I don't know where they got that idea. His Lord Spannerman respected him. Oh, yeah, and followed him loyally in war and peace. But none could be named his friends. Yeah. They probably didn't want to get genocided, I'm thinking. That may may have been part of it. Um, yeah, so... His lords Bannermen, the ones who hadn't been genocided, were rather obedient for a time. Anyway, but none could be named his friends. Yeah, so it's a a fun, uneasy piece that Tywin rules over there. Uh, Tywin despised his father, the weak-willed, fat, and ineffectual Lord Tytos Lannister, and his relations with his brothers Tyget and Jerrion were notoriously stormy. Yeah, Tygat and Jerrion, the two Lannisters who seem like fun. According to uh, Tyrion's descriptions, Tywin's not down with fun. He showed more regard for his brother Kevin, a lickspittle, I'm sorry, close confidant and constant companion since childhood, and his sister Jenna. But yet, even in these cases, Tywin Lannister appeared more dutiful than affectionate. Right, because all of his emotion, he, he burned out of himself at an early age for some reason oh man this this is rich really great stuff you see why i wanted to read this in 263 ac after a year as the king's hand sir tywin married his beautiful young cousin first cousin joanna lannister who had come to king's landing in 259 for the coronation of king jaehaerys the second and remained thereafter as a lady in waiting to princess later queen rayella The bride and groom had known each other since they were children together at Casterly Rock. Oh, that's not weird. Though Tywin Lannister was not a man given to public display, it is said that his love for his lady wife was deep and long abiding. Right. Only Lady Joanna. So this is some Picel right here. Only Lady Joanna truly knows the man beneath the armor. Grand Maester Picel wrote the Citadel. Picel thinks a lot about the man Beneath the armor, you understand. And all his smiles belong to her, and her alone. I do avow that I have even observed her make him laugh, not once, but upon three separate occasions. <laughs> Pycelle. Man. Sadly, the marriage between Ares the Second Targaryen and his sister Rhaella was not as happy. Though she turned a blind eye to most of the king's infidelities, the queen did not approve of his, quote, turning my ladies into his whores. That's a very important line. This is where we start talking about uh, Tyrion Targaryen theory. So, for Rayella to say that, he's she's basically saying, yeah, sleep around, but don't do it with my ladies in waiting. 
That is too insulting. So one of his ladies-in-waiting, potentially, was raped or coerced or slept with Aries. We don't know. Uh, somewhere on that continuum. Uh, but that's potentially Joanna Lannister, who Aries definitely has a thing for, as we will see. So it says, turning my ladies into W word. Uh, Joanna Lannister was not the first lady to be dismissed abruptly from her grace's service, nor was she the last. So it's definitely implying something there. Because they're saying Joanna was dismissed abruptly along with other ladies that were Rayella's right after this quote. So, relations between the king and the queen grew even more strained when Rayella proved unable to give Ares any further children. Miscarriages in 263 and 264 were followed by a stillborn daughter in 267. That's rough. Like, even one miscarriage or stillbirth is a very traumatic event for a mother and, a, you know, a loving couple that are parents so two miscarriages and a stillborn daughter in four years then prince daron in 269 survived for only half a year then came another stillbirth in 270 another miscarriage in 271 and prince aegon born two turns premature in 272 dead in 273 so one two miscarriages three miscarriages, two stillbirths, and two children who died young. So that's like, that's just brutal. Really just really rough there. Um, so here's a sidebar. Uh, the scurrilous rumor that Joanna Lannister gave up her maidenhead to Prince Aerys the night of his father's coronation and enjoyed a brief reign as, as his paramour after he ascended the Iron Throne, can be safely discounted. As Pycelle insists in his letters, Tywin Lannister would scarce have taken his cousin to wife if that had been true, for he was ever a proud man and not one accustomed to get ready to gag, feasting upon another man's leavings. It's been reliably reported, however, that King Ares took unwanted liberties with Lady Joanna's person during her bedding ceremony to Tywin's displeasure. Not long thereafter, Queen Rhaella dismissed Joanna Lannister from her service. No reason for this was ever given, but Lady Joanna departed at once for Casterly Rock and seldom visited King's Landing thereafter. So, there's something going on here. We just don't know how far it went, but there is definitely some Aries, Tywin, I mean, Aries, Joanna stuff. And this denial, we can safely dismiss it because Pycelle says Tywin wouldn't do that, is like, kind of makes you think that that's what happened or that that may have happened. Certainly Pycelle's denial is not convincing, <laughs> is it? <laughs> so... And then obviously the bed, look, the bedding thing is creepy as hell. I'm honestly not sure what George is thinking. I don't know where, if there's a historical precedent for that. It seems super weird and uncomfortable and awkward. And maybe I'm just like prude or something, but like the bedding ceremony is wild. It's body is like, I just feel like that's stretching body a little far, but I don't know. Maybe shit was different in medieval times. But for Ares, the king, to be taking liberties, like, that means he was molesting her and sexually abusing her. You know, so this is an echo of the Lord's right. And this is probably another reason why we might imagine Ares taking liberties with Joanna. Like, he's exactly the kind of king to be like, oh yeah, I've got, I've got prima nocta. I've got the Lord's right. I can sleep with anyone I want to. So is there, so there is precedent for, for the betting. Okay. People are just weird then. <laughs> Definitely historical. Yeah. Customs, man, people, 
culture is weird. Customs are weird. <laughs> People do some weird stuff. <clears throat> anyway, it's all perspective, I guess. So yeah, safely discounted. Definitely no, no fire, no smoke or fire there. Let's see. So Joanna dealing with miscarriages, all this stuff, dealing with her, her ladies in waiting, being abused, raped, or just seduced uh, by Aries. And uh, yeah, so this sucks. <laughs> so this is why I say like, no, nah, there's... Aries is not necessarily what, I mean, I guess you could say he's a normal king if you want to take like a very corrupt view on uh, what is normal, but he's definitely showing a lot of bad signs pretty early on. So at first, it's because like, th so <laughs> this is where we say believe women. Like if Rayella is quoted as saying, don't turn my ladies into whores, like, that means something was going on. She didn't just say that for no reason. Obviously, some of that was happening, right? At first, his grace comforted Rayella in her grief, but over time, and this is going back to talking about the miscarriages and stuff, over time, his compassion turned to suspicion. By 270 AC, he had decided that the queen was being unfaithful to him. So projecting a bit, more than a bit, Quote, the gods will not suffer a bastard to sit the Iron Throne, he told his small council. None of Rayella's stillbursts, miscarriages, or dead princes had been his, the king proclaimed. <laughs> Thereafter, he forbade his queen to leave the confines of Magor's holdfast and decreed that two septas would henceforth share her bed every night to see that she remains true to her vows. So that's abusive and gaslighty. Um... What Tywin Lannister made of this is not recorded, but in 266 at Casterly Rock, Lady Joanna gave birth to a pair of twins, a girl and a boy, healthy and beautiful, with hair like beaten gold. This birth only exacerbated the tension between Ares II Targaryen and his hand. I appear to have married the wrong woman, his grace was reported to have said, when informed of the happy event. Nonetheless, he sent each child its weight in gold as a name-day gift and commanded Tywin to bring them to court when they were old enough to travel. And bring their mother, too, for it has been too long since I gazed upon that fair face. And here dies the Jamie and Cersei R. Targaryen theory. It's dead. It just died right there. Zero percent chance. Yes. Cersei is a parallel to Mad King Ares with the wildfire. In a million ways, she is a parallel to Mad King Ares. They are not related. Because it tells you right here, when Jamie and Cersei were born, Ares was like, yes, bring them to court because I haven't seen Joanna in a long time. Meaning there was they were not in proximity. There's no way for Ares to get Joanna pregnant. And this is, pay attention to the writing here. Like this is specifically put in here so that we know it is not possible. So this is, this is, nine months is not a long time. No, it is not. It is not. Not in this context. Because what we're talking about here is visiting back and forth between Casterly Rock and King's Landing. No, nine months is not even close to a long time. Please don't do this to me. That's not even close. She It says that she rarely visited court anymore. So once every few years is what we're talking. So yeah, no Jamie and Cersei Targaryen. Yes, they like incest. Yes, Cersei is crazy. No, they are not Targaryens. Zero chance. Again, it's been far too long since I gazed upon that fair face. You wouldn't see that if you just saw her 10 months ago. The following year, 267 AC, saw the death of Lord Titus Lannister at the age of 6 and 40. 
Reportedly, his lordship's heart burst as he was climbing a steep turnpike stair to the bedchambers of his mistress. With his passing, Sir Tywin Lannister became the Lord of Casterly Rock and Warden of the West. When he returned to the West to attend his father's funeral and set the Westerlands in order, King Aerys decided to accompany him. Though his grace left his queen behind him in King's Landing, her grace was pregnant with the child who proved to be the stillborn Princess Shayna, another stillbirth. Jesus. He took their eight-year-old son, Rhaegar, Prince of Dragonstone, and more than half the court. Yeah, but also don't don't ignore the line where it says that she hardly ever visited King's Landing afterwards. So you got to put those two together. And when we get to Tyrion, we'll see that specifically George tells us that Joanna and Ares were in the same place about a year before Tyrion was born, in contrast. Yes, the incest is a reflection of their narcissism. That is correct. Good analysis, Garth Greenlawn. Okay, so let's see here. The same could be said of the Targaryens. Uh, He took their eight-year-old son, Prince Rhaegar, Prince of Dragonstone, and more than half the court. For the better part of the next year, the Seven Kingdoms were ruled from Lannisport and Casterly Rock, where both the king and his hand were in residence. The court returned to King's Landing in 268, and governance resumed as before, but it was plain to all that the friendship between the king and his hand was fraying. Where previous, previously Ares had sided with Tywin Lannister on most matters of substance, that's the point of having a smart half, No, no, rarely is, no, rarely means that they don't come very often. It means every few years. So I'm stop. You got to stop with that. Like if you have in a song of ice and fire theory, when you read the text, it should give you more evidence for it. Not less. If you have to sort of bulldoze your theory past evidence that's like, eh, probably not, probably not. And you're like, well, maybe, maybe that's not like how we do this. Um, Like sometimes people comment and they're like, well, what if, what if the long night was caused by something else? And it's like, well, yeah, what if maybe, but like the clues say it was a comet and moon meteors. So that's what our theory is because that's what the evidence points to. So it's like, what we're seeing, this is reverse logic. Like some people have this idea that that uh, Jamie and Cersei are Ares' kids. And so then they just, they're rearranging everything to try to like make that theory true. But if you look at the text here, it's just throwing ice water on that theory. It's like, no, nah, they hadn't seen each other in a long time. She rarely visited anymore. So yeah, neither Jamie or Cersei look even slightly Targaryen. Whereas Tyrion has white hair, which is the same platinum white color that some Targaryens have. And he has mismatched eyes, which we've seen twice uh, among Targaryens. So anyways, yes, there's a difference between headcanon and theory. That's right. So in my opinion, Jamie and Cersei Targaryen is a 0% chance DOA theory. <clears throat> Tyrion Targaryen, however, is another matter. Another matter. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. Where are we here? Friendship was fraying. Previously, Ares had sided with T- uh, Tywin most of the time, but now the two men began to disagree. During a trade war between the free cities of Myr and Tyrosh on the one hand and Volantis on the other, Lord Tywin advocated a policy of neutrality. King Aerys saw more advantage in providing gold and arms to the Volantines. When Lord Tywin adjudicated a border dispute between House Blackwood and House Bracken in favor of the Blackwoods, his grace overruled him and gave the disputed mill to Lord Bracken. Over his hand's strenuous objections, the king doubled the port fees at King's Landing in Old Town and tripled them for Lannisport and the realm's other ports and harbors. Now, here's an interesting point. So we we saw earlier... That, Ty, that Tywin lowered taxes and tariffs. And we can assume that Aegon V may have raised some of those, okay? 
But listen to what Tywin did. Not only did he lower taxes, he also built roads and paid back the debts that they owed the Iron Bank. So it's like, oh, well, where did that money come from? He decreased revenue and then spent a bunch of money. How'd he do that? With his own gold. So he kind of bought himself political power. That's what he did. He used his gold to solve Ares' problems. However, when you lower taxes and you decrease the income, eventually the crown may run short of money. So it could be that Ares raised the taxes here just to spite Tywin. Because it does sound like, oh, Tywin ruled in favor, of the, uh, in favor of the Blackwoods. And then Ares is like, no, the Brackens. That sounds like Ares is just becoming insecure with Tywin's authority and disagreeing with him just so he's doing his own thing, right? However, raising taxes might have been something that he needed to do because Tywin lowered taxes. We don't know, but I just, you know, reading between the lines here, it's interesting. Because we're told that Tywin used his own gold to fill the gaps. So that's not going to be sustainable. That means they're running a shortfall, potentially. <clears throat> so, over his hands, strenuous objections. The king, Okay, doubled the taxes. When a delegation of small lords and rich merchants came before the Iron Throne to complain, however, Ares blamed the hand for the exactions, saying, Lord Tywin shits gold, but of late he's been constipated and I had to find some other way to fill our coffers. Well, that's actually just what I'm saying. Lord Tywin shits gold, ah, ha, ha, ha. But no, Lord Tywin was filling the royal coffers with his own gold and covering the shortfalls. So, as their relationship deteriorated, perhaps Tywin stopped doing that. And then, so what? Just what I said. Ares had to raise taxes now. And then when they came and asked him, be like, yeah, my hand was just trucking in gold from Casterly Rock, but he stopped. And uh, so now I got to raise, raise the taxes that he lowered a couple years ago. Maybe. Now that's giving Ares the benefit of the doubt, but I just, this whole thing is written to be pro Tywin. So we do have to consider that maybe everything isn't so one-sided as it looks. <clears throat> Okay, so I don't think that cough muted. Apologies. Where were we? Uh, whereupon his grace restored port fees and tariffs to their previous levels. So, but then Ares lowered the taxes again. So that earned him a claim for himself and left Tywin uh, holding the bag, apparently. I'm not sure about that. Hey, Grey Waste Tim. What's up there, buddy? A growing rift between the king and the king's hand was also apparent in the matter of appointments, whereas previously his grace had always heeded his hand's counsel, bestowing offices, honors, and inheritance as Lord Tywin recommended. After 270 AC, he began to disregard the men put forward by his lordship in favor of his own choices. Many Westermen found themselves dismissed from the king's service for no better cause than the suspicion that they may have been hands men. In their places, King Ares appointed his own favorites, but the king's favor had become a chancy thing. His mistrust easy to awaken. So this is more paranoia, just like when he fired everyone when he took office. Same thing. Like, if you don't trust your hand, get rid of him and get a new hand that you do trust. Allowing this rift to grow where you don't trust anyone that's close to Tywin, but he's your hand. That's, that's pretty dumb. So even the hand's own kin were not exempt from royal displeasure. When Lord Tywin wished to name his brother Sir Tyget Lannister as the Red Keep's master-at-arms, King Ares gave the post instead to Sir Willem Derry. By this time, King Ares had become aware of the widespread belief that he himself had was but a hollow figurehead and Tywin Lannister the true master of the Seven Kingdoms. These sentiments greatly angered the king, and his grace became determined to disprove them and to humble his overmighty servant, put him back into his place. Kelly, I have no idea how many Dornishmen survived the Tridents. I, that is not a question for me, my brother. That is something we might be able to get into when we do our detailed Battle of the Tridents stream, which we'll do maybe in a month from now. Um, 
at that point I'll do all the research and figure out, you know, how many troops were in each part of the armies and stuff. I have no idea off the top of my head though. No idea. A lot of people died at the Trident. I do know that. Let's see here. At the great anniversary tourney of 272 AC, held to commemorate Ares' 10th year upon the Iron Throne, Joanna Lannister brought her six-year-old twins, Jamie and Cersei, from Casterly Rock to present before the court. 272 AC, pay attention to the date. The king, very much in his cups, asked her if giving suck to them had, quote, ruined your breasts which were so high and proud. The question greatly amused Lord Tywin's rivals, who were always pleased to see the hand slighted or made mock of, but Lady Joanna was humiliated. Tywin Lannister attempted to return his chain of office the next morning, but the king refused to accept his resignation. Ares II could, of course, have dismissed Tywin Lannister at any time and named his own man as Hand of the King, but instead, for whatever reason, the king chose to keep his boyhood friend close by him laboring on his behalf, even as he began to undermine him in ways both great and small. Slights and jibes became ever more numerous. Courtiers, hoping for advancement, soon learned that the quickest way to catch the king's eye was by making mock of his solemn, humorless hand. Yet through all this, Tywin Lannister suffered in silence. Okay, couple things. So this, what we're told is that after everything that's happened between Tywin and Ares. It was this public insult that made Tywin try to return his chain of office. And I'm not saying that's not believable. If you insult my wife at a dinner party in front of people, I'm probably trying to fight you. You know, and if you're the king and you can't start a fight, then what do you do? You resign. That 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 does fit. However, there could be more here. Um we know that obviously we know that Ares has a thing for Joanna and that he at the very least already assaulted her during the betting. So perhaps Tywin was attempting to return the chain of office here because there was more that happened than this insult. The insult is just what is remembered by the maesters, but perhaps something else went down. So, Ares, um, let's see, in 273 AC, however, Lady Joanna was taken to childbed once again at Casterly Rock. So this was all in 272. Joanna's in King's Landing. There is some sort of offense between Ares and Joanna. Maybe it was just this insult. And then Tywin tried to quit. Ares refused him. A year later, Tyrion is born. Two seventy three, Joanna taken to childbed once again at Casterly Rock, where she died delivering Tywin's second son, Tyrion, as the babe was named, uh, was a malformed dwarfish babe born with stunted legs, an oversized head, and mismatched demonic eyes. Again, it's just the maesters. Some reports also suggest he had a tail which was lopped off at his lord father's command. <laughs> It's funny that he doesn't dismiss that one. He's like, yeah, that could be true. Lord Tywin's doom, the small folk called. The ill-made creature and Lord Tywin's bane. Upon hearing of his birth, King Ares infamously said, the gods cannot abide such arrogance. They have plucked a fair flower from his hand and given him a monster in her place to teach him some humility at last. So... You tell me who's more arrogant, Tywin or Ares. I mean, they're quite the pair, really. So everything that Ares is saying, if Tywin is Ares', I mean, if Tyrion is Ares' son, this is a very ironic passage. Ares saying, the gods cannot abide such arrogance. They've given him a monster. It's like, well, he's arrogant and he may have given birth to that monster. So... Yeah, this is, um, and yes, of course, some of the Targaryen dragon lizard babies do have tails. Absolutely. That's happened enough times that we know that is true. So this tail thing, it could be 
an actual dragon thing, or it could just be a, a, a hearsay rumor that George threw in to get us to sort of think of Tyrion as a lizard baby. So hard to say if there is an actual tale, but it definitely makes us think of Targ lizard babies. Oh, somebody's got the answer about the Dornish troops. Very good. There you go, Kelly. Thanks, chat. Thank you, Lapu Lapu Vanquisher of Magellan. That's a badass handle name. Okay, um, let me hit the music real quick. I'm going to get the full funky music since I messed it up last time. Oh, the gelato. Mm. All right, let's fill this hole with some Aries artwork. I do have a few Aries artworks to share with y'all. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's reading Rhaegon. It's reading Rhaegon. Ra Ra oh, sorry. Woo. Not ready for that note. Loving you. Ah! Okay. Woo. Mm, the viewers are plummeting. What happened? I promise I'll stop. Mm. It's reading Rhaegon. Oh, that's better. All right. Sorry. Okay. Uh, this one is by Baldy Kanjin. Definitely got the, the burn them all moment, obviously, which on the show looked like this. Looked like this. Compute, it looked like, there you go. Burn them all. Burn them all. I did love this segment from the uh, from the show. It was very, very... Like, for the most part, the show did not do a great job with the vision sequences and stuff. That's George writes very psychedelically. It was hard to translate to television. But it was very cool to have Bran see Ares saying the command, burn them all. That was sick. Because Danny saw that in her undying vision in the books, but not on the show. So we got it from Bran. Very cool moment. Uh, didn't Ares move the court to the rock for you? Yeah, we just read that part. That was earlier. That was uh, when Tyrion and uh, that was when Jamie and Cersei were six and before Tyrion was born. Uh, yeah, that was uh, David's voice scared my cat. I'm sorry. I take full responsibility. Love, love in you. Well, I see the falsetto is not <clears throat> the falsetto is not there until later in the day. I can do that. I can do the 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 love in you thing. That's. Anyway, Old South Park, for those of y'all who are too young. Let's get back to the artwork. So this is The Mad King with Wildfire by Javier Bahamande. So there's the pyromancers behind him. Hallien and... Not Hallien. Uh, Rossert. Rossert, who was actually the hand. This is Sharksten. This is... Uh, we did not use this for the cover art. But it's a little intense. But uh, this this is the this is the real King Ares with the long nails and the, the psychotic look and the the torture and the yeah I guess that's Rickard post burning or something. No, he's burned at his armor. That's just some poor schmuck. This one is sick. This is by uh, Dimitro. Oh God. Kotolyarov. 
Kotal Yarov, we'll say. And that's pretty just, wow. That's sick. I almost used that for the cover, but I went with the one that I did. This is pretty sick, though. Uh, this is Duskendale, which we'll get to. So we'll come back to this picture, and that's by Mark Simonetti. This is by Jake Murray. I almost used this for the cover art, too. How does he eat with those wicked talons? Yeah, I don't know. They're probably not quite that long, but. Uh, and a Song of Ice and Fire cover to Hunger Strike. I think I messed with that. I don't mind stealing bread. Who steals bread? Who steals bread? What did I, what was my angle on that? Okay, let's get back on topic here. Mariah, Mariah, bad Mariah. <laughs> From the miles of decadence. Oh, that's, that's a great song, man. If you don't know Hunger Strike, look that up. That's the best thing the 90s produced. I'm going hungry. Thanks. Great ways, Tim. It's got me on the backup vocals. You got, you got me on the backup vocals. <laughs> no, I don't think you get demonetized unless you play the music. I think I'm okay with singing, but I just was talking about that with my manager last night. So we'll see. Sounds like Creed. No, no. That's the whole point. Anyway, go look it up. Educate yourselves. Creed learned that from somewhere. I'll just say that. Moving right along. Mad King Aries by Arthur, Bar Ar Arthur Buzzinay. See, I think this has got the nail. That's probably about what the nails are like. Right about there. Well, no, I can do the Eddie Vedder vocals. It's just the, the falsetto I can't handle right now. I can sing Bee Gees and stuff when I'm warmed up. <clears throat> oh, man, I almost did it. No falsetto. Okay, so this is Francel Garrett. I mean, don't you guys sing Staying Alive in Conversation? Don't you just throw that out sometimes? I don't know. There's always some context for that. Francel Garrett. Garrett. Two R's. So this is dope. A little bit. Um, you can see the artist here might be speculating that Aries was having dragon dreams. Uh, and Jamie says that he thought that he would turn himself into a dragon when he burned King's Landing. So, uh, you know, I think it's almost certain he was having dragon dreams. So this kind of imagines his death. Superimposed about the, over the dragons that he never did hatch. Uh, and this is the one I did use for the cover. This is by Couple of Kooks. And this is both Rhaegar and Ares together. There is Rhaegar in the trident, the ruby ford. So you can see the rubies. Oh, I never noticed the rubies before, actually. That's dope. Sort of from his hand there. <clears throat> yeah, we're gonna. So I, Orange Tabby, I threw out the idea the other day that we would do when I hit 100,000 subs, which we're real close to, by the way, if you're watching and you haven't subbed, give me your, give it to me. We're almost there, 100,000. Uh, we'll probably celebrate with something musical and silly that I won't even bother trying to monetize just so we can have fun. And this is the Aries part. So this is like a tragic Greek Aries. Like, I just really love this. That's why I chose it for the cover. It's, uh, oh, that's what it was. I don't mind stealing sheep. That's what it was, Matt Hicks. It was a, a sheep stealer song. That's exact. I wrote the lyrics for it already. I have it somewhere. I'll look it up. I don't mind stealing sheep. That's what it, that's what it was. That is absolutely what it was. I have to look it up now. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, before Christmas, that would be good. Deep trip. That should be the goal. 100,000 before Christmas. That's all I want for Christmas, folks. I'll wear my psychedelic Santa shirt and everything. All right, let's get this back on the rails. How many viewers have we lost? Oh, none. Thank you. You all must love me. Okay, moving right along. It was not long before reports of the king's remarks about, remember, 
oh, Tywin's so arrogant and they've plucked a fair flower from his hand and given him a monster. So it was not long before reports of the king's remarks reached Tywin as he grieved at Casterly Rock. Thereafter, no shred of the old affection between the two men endured. Never a man to make a show of his emotion, Lord Tywin continued on as hand of the king, dealing with the daily tedium of the Seven Kingdoms, while the king grew ever more erratic, violent, and suspicious. So, um, there's remember, there's a line where Tywin is talking to Tyrion, and he says something like, you're my son because I, I can't prove that you aren't, or something like that. Is If anyone can use a search of ice and fire and look up that line, it's search, search Tywin and my son, and I bet that will come up. But he says something to Tyrion about that indicates that Tywin like might not be sure. <laughs> Tywin might have been nursing doubts about Tyrion his whole life. I think that is safe to say. It doesn't mean that Tyrion is Ares' son. But I think there is indication that Tywin has doubts. So let me see if somebody can find that quote for me, and I'll keep reading in the meantime. Let's see here. Um, so no, no affection anymore. Never a man to make a show of his emotion. Lord Tywin continued on his hand of the king, dealing with the daily tedium of the Seven Kingdoms, while the king grew ever more... Oh, I just said that. Earlier there was a line about Tywin suffering in silence while people laughed about stuff. No, he was not suffering in silence. He was building a mountain of hatred. That's what he was doing in silence. And that all comes back around during the sack of King's Landing. So, yeah. We were building a mountain. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, just to, just real quick. One of the thing about Tyrion Targaryen is people are like, oh, well, Tyrion is the most like Tywin. And I agree, absolutely. And I think this is a good example of what George might be showing us nature versus nurture. Like, Jon Snow is not Ned's son, but he's the most Ned-like in some ways. Ned raised him. How not, you know? Um, so, like, yeah, Tyrion and Tywin's relationship is very interesting. And we'll delve more into the psychology of that on the Tywin stream. Um, but, yeah, I see no issue with Tyrion being actually not Tywin's son and yet they're having this very interesting relationship. I think it just adds another layer of interest and complexity as opposed to undercutting it. But we'll definitely come back to that topic on the Tywin stream in two weeks. So, ever more erratic. Um, Ares began to surround himself with informers. Informer? <laughs> Paying hands. I, I have a Jon Snow informer cover that I wrote. I have not had the courage to try to perform that because that guy talks really fast. But I practiced and I think I can do it. Maybe I'll have to do that for 100K. So anyway, if you know Informer, then props, props, okay? <clears throat> that's Daddy Snow. That's right. It's Daddy Snow. You barely, it was right there. I was like, well, obviously this has got to be about Jon Snow. All right. Shout out Jonas Baratheon. I feel like I'm I've not I'm really spinning my wheels here, but I'll try to get back. I'm having fun. I hope you guys are having fun. All right. When one such, oh no, informers paying handsome uh, rewards to men of dubious repute for whispers, lies, and tales of treasons real and imagined. When one such reported that the captain of the hands personal guard, a knight named Sir Ilian Payne, had been heard boasting that it was Lord Tywin who truly ruled the Seven Kingdoms. His grace sent the king's guard to arrest the man and had his tongue ripped out with red-hot pinchers. Fun. I think I'd rather die. <laughs> like, honestly, just, they throw that around so much. They're like, oh yeah, tear out his tongue with hot pinch. Like, yeah, to kill me. <laughs> anyway. The march of the king's madness seemed to abate for a time in 274 AC, 
when Queen Rayella gave birth to a son. So profound was his grace's joy that it seemed to restore him to his old self once again. But Prince Jeharis died later that same year. Oh, he named him after his father. <sighs> died later that same year, plunging Ares into despair. In his black rage, he decided the babe's wet nurse was to blame and had the woman beheaded. Wow, wow. Mm. Yeah, actually, Tim, you're right. You can't cut off my hands either. You can't cut off any of my body parts. You're going to have to kill me first. <laughs> That's definitely... Yeah, Gerald Garcia. Men's laws give you the right to bear my name and display my colors since I cannot prove that you are not mine. Thank you, Gerald. Using his, by the way, if you throw down $5 a month to become a channel member squisher, not only do you get your name highlighted with a cool squisher icon and you get to use the emojis, you get one free super chat a month, which Gerald has just used. So thank you. And yeah, take a look at that. Men's laws give you the right to bear my name and display my colors since I cannot prove that you are not mine. That's kind of crazy. Kind of makes you wonder why Tywin didn't just throw Tyrion down a well. I'm not saying that you should throw kids down a well, but just saying given that Tywin is sort of a psychopath, I guess he just wasn't sure. He was not sure. And so he raises Tyrion anyway, and he has this weird love-hate relationship. He keeps him around, but he kind of hates him. A little bit like the way Ares keeps Tywin around and then just antagonizes him. So, lots of weird, abusive relationships here. Yeah, you are not the father. <laughs> you see why I say that, like, Tyrion Targaryen is a definite possibility. Um, and it already was something we were wondering about we in the fandom, when the World of Ice and Fire came out in 2014, people read this section and was like, oh, this is a whole lot of Tyrion Targaryen evidence. And Jamie and Cersei, you know, are kind of, that theory is dead. That is how most people took this. And you can see why. And of course, Tyrion also has dragon dreams and thinks about riding dragons and burning his family with dragon fire and all kinds of wild stuff that's there. I have a very old video called Tyrion Targaryen. It's only a podcast. It's just audio, but it is on the YouTube channel. It's one of my very oldest ones and it's got a bunch of symbolism in there, but I do deal with all of my evidence for that Tyrion is a Targaryen for those of you who like that theory. All right. <clears throat> so, well, so when you say when the word psychopath, again, I usually, um, I, my best idea of the definition of psychopath is someone or that I guess I'm thinking of sociopath. Isn't that pretty much the same thing when you don't have any empathy essentially, and you just sort of use brutal violence without really any cost to yourself as far as moral conflict, I'd have to look it up. Um, Tywin's not like unstable. He's like malevolent. Um, let's see a psychopath. Let's see a person affected by a chronic mental disorder with abnormal or violent social behavior. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Cersei does come across more like a psychopath. Tywin, it feels like he's got a leash on it. Like he's, it doesn't just leak out whenever. He keeps it restrained. But then both of those are words not used anymore. Yeah, a lot of the mental health words have been updated. That's true. Um, and there, and right, it should be said, like some sociopathy is an actual thing that people do have. It's not just a term for people who are like mean or something like it's a wiring condition uh, where people struggle to feel empathy. It's like literally like a brain wiring thing. Like I struggle to measure lengths of time uh, outside of a couple of days or whatever. So that doesn't necessarily mean uh, also like, yeah, narcissism. Narcissism is something that we kind of use as a pejorative 
but people can't like just people. It's a real condition that you can have. And not everybody that has clinical narcissism is going to be like some horrible person necessarily, because like anything else, you can become self-aware of whatever you're dealing with uh, and eventually work to compensate it. I think that's a correct way to characterize it. I'm doing my best to characterize it. Um, but yes, there is something wrong with Tywin. Um, sociopaths have a conscience, albeit a weak one, and will often justify something they know to be wrong. Like disassociating is a spectrum. Yeah, all this, any mental health thing is a spectrum. By contrast, psychopaths will believe their actions are justified and feel no remorse for any harm done. Okay, that's an interesting... So let's use that spectrum. Do we think that Tywin is closer to someone that believes their actions are justified and feels no remorse? Or is he someone that has a weak conscience and is has to work to try to justify what he's doing in order to sort of tamp down that conscience? What do you guys think is a better fit? Euron is more like a psychopath. Yeah, Euron seems like he feels utterly no remorse. I think Tywin is closer to a sociopath. Somewhere down deep, he knows what he's doing is wrong. I think that's that's right. But I see I see disagreement. No, I see people coming on both sides of it. So yeah, of course, we're not in Tywin's head. We are in Cersei's head. So we do have better uh, better information to sort of assess what's going on with Cersei. But Tywin at age 20 did the whole Reigns of Castamere thing. So like, I mean, that is a monstrous act. It is hard for me to think of like a quote unquote typical person doing that, even in the framework. Yeah, see, baby, that's the key thing. He's driven by insecurity. Tywin. Euron is delusional. Euron is so immersed in the magical reality of this world that he's not even operating on the same framework as most people of morality and empathy and stuff. Measured psychopath. That sounds kind of right. If Tywin was a psychopath, he would have made different actions when he was hand for Ares. Yeah, because he mostly did do a good job as Hand. Um, he's an egotistical, narcissistic person that feels no empathy, but gets his ego hurt easily and overcorrects. There's definitely this horrific rage in response to feeling embarrassed or slighted that Tywin has. That is the main attribute that I see with Tywin, is he nurses those resentments and then does something horrible about it. Like with the Reigns and Castamere's, they made a fool out of the Lannisters and his father. And so that built a well of rage in him, I think from the age of 12. At the age of 12, he did something. He said something at a feast, I believe Joanna is talking about. Yeah, there is, there is something that Joanna was talking about where Tywin stood up at a feast and, and uh, castigated the Reigns or the Tarbex, one of them. So he's, since the age of 12, at least, he's had it in for them. And then when he turned 20, he went and handled that. So, all right, well, that's, thanks. I appreciate your um, comments there, chat. It's an interesting discussion with Tywin. And again, we'll come back to Tywin in a couple of weeks. But again, the Ares-Tywin thing is really interesting because Ares is more visibly crazy. He's unstable and... You know, even when he's doing positive things like, oh, I want to build a second wall. I want to do this. I want to do that. It's unstable and stuff. Tywin is not like that. Like Tywin is grounded. He does a good job as an administrator. He just, there's a little bit of a glitch as far as, again, empathy and having a conscience and cruelty goes. Like he's just monstrously cruel. I uh, just, wow. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to the reading here. So 
So he's just beheaded. The nurse of, of, of uh, young Jaharis who died. Not long after, it, uh, in a change of heart, Ares announced that Jaharis had been poisoned by his own mistress, the pretty young daughter of one of his household knights. The king then had the girl and all her kin tortured to death. During the course of their torment, it is recorded, all confessed to the murder, though the details of their confessions were greatly at odds. So, wow. First he beheaded an innocent wet nurse. Then he blames his own mistress, who was already being taken advantage of by Ares. So we had the girl and all her kin tortured to death. That's cool. So this is right out of the Magor the Cruel playbook here. And this is before Duskendale, I will remind you. So, and this is another thing where characterizations are one thing, um, but this these are facts. Like, if the maesters are saying Ares had all these people tortured to death, then he did. That's not something that the maesters made up. He really did that. Um, yeah, and of course, it just shows, yeah, torture doesn't work. People will say anything when they're being tortured. So they all confessed, but none of the details matched because none of them were true. <clears throat> so, afterward, King Ares fasted for a fortnight and made a walk of repentance across the city to the Great Sept to pray with the High Septon. So that's disgusting. The High Septon, right after Ares tortured and murdered a bunch of innocent people, one of whom was his mistress, which is a sexual sin in the eyes of the faith, he allows Ares to have a public display of purity and walk over to the Sept to be anointed. Like, that's disgusting. That just shows you, like, the High Septon of that time has no ethics whatsoever. That's wild. <laughs> On his return, his grace announced that henceforth he would sleep only with his lawful wife, Queen Rayella. You know, I tortured a bunch of people and I've seen the light. Yes, it definitely happens in reality. That is why I'm highlighting this. This is exactly the kind of crap that we see going on in the real world. And I feel myself wanting to make a real world political comparison, but we definitely see murder and genocide whitewashed in public by our highest officials using all kinds of lies and incendiary rhetoric and propaganda. That is something I watched it happen during the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war, and I'm watching it happen right now. So, yeah, this is something that George got from the real world. Oh, God. Or you think of, like, the greenwashing, you know, with corporations and pollution, and then it's like they, they buy off somebody to say, oh, yeah, they're doing it organic, and it's like, yeah. Anyways, yes, I'm well known to be against genocide, for sure. That's definitely, I'm going to come down against all kinds of murder. Um, any murder I'm against, I'm just... My opinion, without getting into specifics, is that people that live in the same part of the world have to learn to coexist. That's, it's that simple. Um, parts of the world where there's a lot of history and people... Many different peoples have ties to a given land, especially areas that are crossroads of civilizations for tens of thousands of years. Nobody's like the actors on both sides that are like the only way forward is to eliminate the other side. That's not a solution. Like you're never going to, you know, just get rid of all of your enemies or bomb your way to peace, right? The United States has tried that so many times. It doesn't work. We were 20 years in Afghanistan trying to bomb our way to peace, and that did not happen. It doesn't work. So 
you know, there are reasons why it's hard. Obviously, when you say, oh, well, the people that live in the same place need to get along. It's not that easy, obviously. That is nevertheless the only long-term solution, right? So I don't think I'm saying anything dramatic or hot takey by saying that. So I will leave it there. But that is, you know, I, I think everybody's having a tough time watching the news right now. So I know that's something that is definitely weighing on me lately and everybody else as well. So I will just say that. Um, anyways, back to the pleasures of King Ares. So the king is going over to the sept and he prays with the high sept and now he's chased. If the chronicles can be believed, Ares remained true to his vow, losing all interest in the charms of women from that day in 275 AC, which maybe... Um, you know, Aries has shown a tendency to be so extreme, right? His actions are very extreme, just one way or the other. So yeah, maybe he went straight edge for a while, if you will. It's like, oh, I won't sleep with, I'm pure and chaste. You know, who knows? His grace's new fidelity was apparently pleasing to the mother above. It must be said. She didn't see any of the torture, apparently. For the following year, Queen Ray, I mean, just really like the, the writing here from the Septon. Oh, it must have pleased the mother. They just wrote that he tortured a bunch of people. And then they're like, well, the mother must have been pleased with his like. <whistles> that is um, just wild, just wild. <clears throat> oh, let's see. Um. I will just real quickly say that uh, there is no such thing as my political party. I do not wholly endorse or subscribe to any political party. I subscribe to the ethics that, uh, that uh, I just espoused. So let's see. I've been doing a lot of criticizing of all the parties lately, just for those of you who are curious. If you want to see me criticizing... Uh, every political party in America. You can find that on Twitter in any case. And I mean, if you just follow what I just said, as far as my statement about uh, what should, you know, what the solution is and stuff, then you can understand why I might be critical of most U S politicians right now. So, and an interesting thing. Um, now nah, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. So let's see. <clears throat> Queen Rayella gave the king a second son that he had prayed for. <clears throat> dun, 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 it's Prince Viserys, born in 276, small but robust, and as beautiful a child as King's Landing had ever seen. Though Prince Rhaegar, at 17, <laughs> was a sexy beast, was everything that could be wanted in an heir apparent. All Westeros rejoiced to know that he at last had a brother, another Targaryen, to su secure the succession. The birth of Prince Viserys only seemed to make Ares II more fearful and obsessive, however, though the new young princeling seemed healthy enough. The king was terrified, lest he suffer the same fate as his brothers. Let me go to a non-dead Ares here. Let's, uh, we'll go with this one. Kingsguard knights were commanded to stand over him day and night, night and day, to see that no one touched the boy without the king's leave. Even the queen herself was forbidden to be alone with the infant, well, so here, here begins the, I wonder why Viserys is all messed up train of thought. <laughs> it's not allowed to be alone with his mother as an infant. That's cool. Um, when her milk dried up, Ares insisted on having his own food taster suckle at the teats of the prince's wet nurse, quintessentially George Martin detail to include, to ascertain the woman had not smeared poison across her nipples. Anytime we can put nipples in there. As gifts for the young prince arrived from all the lords of the seven kingdoms, the king had them piled in the yard and burnt for fear that some of them might have been ensorcelled or cursed. Just throwing this out as a political move, maybe say thank you for the gifts and then quietly dispose of them. But no, we must pile them in the yard and burn them. It's just friggin' drama queen. To put it mildly, um, 
<laughs> Let's see. Later that same year, Lord Tywin Lannister, perhaps unwisely, held a great tournament at Lannisport in honor of Viserys' birth. Mayhaps it was meant as a gesture towards reconciliation. There, the wealth and power of House Lannister was displayed for all the realm to see. King Aerys at first refused to attend, then relented, but the queen and her new son were kept under confinement back at King's Landing. There, seated on his throne amongst hundreds of notables in the shadow of Casterly Rock, the king cheered lustily as his son, Prince Rhaegar, newly knighted, unhorsed both Tygett and Jerrion Lannister, and even overcame the gallant Sir Barristan Selmy, before falling in the champion's tilt to the renowned King's Guard Knight Sir Arthur Dane. Perhaps seeking to gain advantage uh, of his grace's high spirits, Lord Tywin chose that very night to suggest that it was past time the king's heir wed and produced an heir of his own. He proposed his own daughter, Cersei, as a wife for the crown prince. So one wonders why Ares thought, or why Tywin thought that this would work. Like, the relationship between Ares and Tywin is completely destroyed at this point. So then Ares shows up for this tourney, and which seems like it was meant by Tywin as a display of his own power, okay? So Ares shows up, and then Tywin proposes Cersei and Rhaegar. Um, see, Ares rejected his proposal brusquely, informing Lord Tywin that he was a good and valuable servant, yet a servant nonetheless, nor did his grace agree. And the thing is, like, Everybody's a servant to the king. All the high lords are servants of the king. Lannister is basically the most powerful house that isn't Targaryen. So it's a little like, okay, Ares. Nor did his grace uh, agree to appoint Lord Tywin's son, Jaime, as squire to Prince Rhaegar. That honor he granted instead to the sons of several of his own favorites, men known to be no friends of House Lannister or the Hand. Oh, I know what Tywin was doing. Tywin had suffered in silence over all these years, but he had also done Ares a huge favor. He propped up Ares' entire reign. The only reason why Ares is still king at this point, really, is because Tywin managed the realm as hand for 15 years. So Tywin is probably thinking to himself, you know, F that mother effer. He owes me. He owes me. I never, I didn't say crap about all that. I suffered in silence and now he's going to pay me back. He's going to reward me for that. He owes me. So I'm going to demand my rights. And the unspoken thought there is, and if he doesn't, ref and if he doesn't give it to me this time, then we're enemies for life. So this is like, the whole reason that Tywin has bided his time is to secure power for his house. That's the long game he's playing. That's why he's using his own gold to cover the shortfalls. So now he's trying to cash in. And it is thrown in his face. So let's see what happens. I'm, just, I'm sure nothing bad will happen from that. Uh, so, uh, yeah... By this time, it was plain to see that Ares II Targaryen was already sliding rapidly into madness, but it was in the year 277 AC that his grace plunged irrevocably into the abyss with the defiance of Duskendale. The ancient harbor town of Duskendale. Let me make this a little... I guess that's fine. The ancient harbor town of Duskendale had been a seat of kings of old in the days of the Hundred Kingdoms, once the most important, that's Dawn Age basically, once the most important port on Blackwater Bay. The town had seen its trade dwindle and its wealth shrink as King's Landing grew and burgeoned, a decline that its young Lord Denny's Darkland wished to halt. Many have long debated why Lord Darkland chose to do what he did, but most agree that his mirish wife, the Lady Sorella, played some part. Her detractors blame her entirely for what happened. The Lay Serpent, as they name her, poisoned Lord Darklin against his king with her pillow talk. Her defenders insist that the folly lay with Lord Denys himself. His wife is hated simply because she was a woman of foreign birth who prayed to gods alien to Westeros. 
that is probably the truth, obviously. We know that that is a thing. Every controversial woman gets labeled a witch. Foreign women are always labeled witches and greeted with suspicion. Um, there is not like skin color racism in Westeros, but there is cultural bigotry, of course, like any part of the world. So the Dornish get some of it. The Northmen get some of it. And definitely at times, the you know, people from Essos. Especially when a high lord marries a woman from Essos, because it's like, oh, you should have married the noble woman of Westeros. And there's weird, possessive, whatever. So, um, yeah, I'm not actually, I'm going to skip over some of the details at the end of the story, to be honest. There's some gory stuff that we don't really need to read. But right here, we're being told that the Darklands have a motive, right? The Darklands used to be kings, and they used to be very wealthy. And ever since King's Landing was built, which is only 250 years ago, you know, only, but the Darklands were kings for much longer than that. So along comes Denny's Darkland. He hears the older stories of how rich they used to be. And he's like, you know, F them Targaryens. That seems to be the motive, not the lace serpent was from Essos. It was Lord Dennis's desire to win a charter for Duskendale that would give it more autonomy from the crown, much as had been done for Dorne many years before. That began the trouble. This did not seem to be such a vast demand. Such charters were common across the narrow sea, as Lady Sorella most certainly had told him. Yet it was understandable that Lord Tywin, as hand, firmly rejected his proposals, for fear it might set a dangerous precedent. Infuriated at the refusal, Lord Darkland then devised, then devised a new plan to win his charter and with it lower port fees and tariffs to allow Duskendale once more to vie for trade with King's Landing, a plan that was pure folly. And it was. The defiance of Duskendale began quietly enough. Lord Dennys, seeing that Ares' erratic behavior had begun to strain his relations with Lord Tywin, refused to pay the taxes expected of him, and instead invited the king to come to Duskendale and hear his petition. It seemed most unlikely that King Ares would ever have considered accepting this invitation until Lord Tywin advised him to refuse in the strongest possible terms, whereupon the king decided to accept informing Grand Maester Pycelle and the small council that he meant to settle this matter himself and bring the defiant Darkland to heel. <clears throat> Against Lord Tywin's advice, the king traveled to Duskendale with a small escort led by Sir Gwain Gaunt of the Kingsguard. The invitation proved to be a trap. Squishers, give me the it's a trap emojis. It's trap. Okay, um... It's a trap. And one that the Targaryen king walked into blindly. He was seized with his escort, and some of the men, most notably Sir Gawain, were killed while attempting to defend their king. The immediate response to the news from Duskendale was shock, then outrage. There were those who urged a sudden assault upon the town to free the king and punish the rebels for this enormity. But Duskendale was surrounded by strong walls and the Dunfort, the ancient seat of House Darkland, which overlooked the harbor, was even more formidable. Taking it by storm would be no easy task. Hi, good girl. Oh, you're all dried off from your shower, girl. Yeah. Hi. You want to be on my shoulder? Okay. Lord Tywin thus sent out riders and ravens gathering forces while commanding the Darklands to give up the king. Lord Denny's instead sent word that if any man, if any attempt was made to break his walls, he would put his grace to death. Some in the small council questioned this, declaring that no son of Westeros would ever dare commit such a heinous crime. But Lord Tywin would not chance it, being a psychopath who absolutely would do that, and whose son did do that. Of course, Jamie killing Ares was good, but... Instead, with a sizable host... He moved to surround Duskendale, blockading it by land and by sea. With the royal host massed outside his walls and his supply chain cut off, Lord Darkland's determination began to falter. He made several efforts to parlay, 
But Lord Tyron refused to hear him, instead repeating his demands for the complete and unconditional surrender of the town and the castle and the release of their king. <clears throat> I'm not sure, Talk Studios. I don't know who the they is. Does it not feel like they are trying to get Ares to act out? Who's they? Like, Lord of Duskendale is doing his own thing, and Tywin advising not to go is obvious. Well, obviously, he shouldn't go. So, I'm not really seeing a conspiracy there. And the royal host massed outside the walls. His determination began to falter. So it was a good move. Tywin did a good move here. He didn't escalate the situation, but he brought the royal force to bear just to visually show him how silly it was to launch a rebellion against the crown when you're just one town. You know, you don't have a whole, you don't have half the realm, right? The defiance lasted for half a year. Within the walls of Duskendale, the mood began to sour as the stores and larders ran dry. Yet, huddled within the ancient Dunfort, Lord Denny's was convinced that it was only a matter of time before Lord Darkland could, would weaken and offer better terms. Those who knew the resolve of Tywood Lannister knew better. Instead, the hand's heart grew harder, and he sent Duskendale's lord one final demand for surrender. This is a fun one. Should he refuse again, Lord Tywin promised, he would take the town by storm and put every man, woman, and child within to the sword. And we know that Tywin will do that. The tale oft told that Lord Tywin sent his bard to deliver the ultimatum and commanded him to sing the reigns of Castamir for Lord Denny's and the Lace Serpent is a colorful detail that is, alas, unsupported by the records. However, we know better, folks, because we've been inside that room, haven't we? Haven't we? Yes. So what's going on is we've seen this. Like the Red Wedding, when Tywin is sending these messages, he absolutely does play the reins of Castamere for shits and giggles. He had the minstrels play it at the Red Wedding. So, yeah. Did Tywin have a minstrel play the reins of Castamere? Yeah, you're damn right he did. And that's where Jamie got the idea you know, with uh, Edmure Tully. I bless the rains down in Castamere. Yeah, nice. That's a good one. So, shout out to the Red Wedding. Most of the small council were with the hand outside Duskendale at this juncture, and several of them argued against Lord Tywin's plan on the grounds that such an attack would almost certainly goad Lord Darkland into putting King Aerys to death. He may or he may not, Tywin Lannister reportedly replied, but if he does, we have a better king right here, whereupon he raised a hand to indicate Prince Rhaegar. Scholars have debated ever since as to Lord Tywin's intent. Did he believe Lord Darkland would back down, or was he in truth willing and perhaps even eager to see Aerys die so that Prince Rhaegar might take the Iron Throne? No one will ever know for certain, thanks to the courage of Sir Barristan Selmy. Okay, so, yes, this is an incredible detail. Tywin said this in front of the highest lords in the realm, and that means that this definitely happened. This is not hearsay. And he said it right in front of Rhaegar and pointed at Rhaegar. So, from this point on, there will be speculation about Rhaegar. And it starts here. And yeah, you can. this is a win-win for Tywin. This is a win-win for everybody. Like, <laughs> Tywin said, I don't give a crap about the Mad King, but I'm very busy and need to get back to running the kingdoms. Yeah, exactly. So this is like barely a conspiracy here. This is... Just Tywin being real, kind of. He's like, look, we're not going to let these people hold us by the balls forever. If they put the king to death, it's not the end of the world, actually, if you think about it. And he's right. You know, only a couple of years later, it seems like Rhaegar and other high lords are trying to organize to gently depose Ares because he's friggin' gone crazy. 
So, Sir Barristan Selmy. Sir Barristan offered to enter the town in secret, to find his way to the Dunfort and spear the king to safety. Selmy had been known as Barristan the Bold since his youth, but this was a boldness that Tywin Lannister felt bordered on madness. Yet, such was his respect for the prowess and courage of Sir Barristan that he gave him a day to attempt his plan before storming Duskendale. Or, he figured this will never work, Sir Barristan will probably just get the king killed, and then I won't even have to get blamed for it. That's probably what happened there. Right? I mean, that's, that's how I read that. So, the songs of Sir Barristan's daring rescue of the king are many, and... For rarity, the singers hardly had to embroider it. Sir Barristan did indeed scale the walls unseen. In the dark of the night, sure thing, Isaac. Uh, using nothing but his bear. And I just want to clarify, I'm speaking up for literally all innocent people caught in war-torn places. And I'm speaking against anybody on either side of any conflict who seem to just see more war as the answer. So I do want to be clear about that. Um that applies broadly to many conflicts and regions that is always going to guide my politics and how not right? Like empathy, innocent lives. Let's protect them anyways, but yes, you're welcome. So let's see here. Um, Sir Barristan did indeed scale the walls unseen in the dark of the night using nothing but his bare hands. And he did disguise himself as a hooded beggar as he made his way to the Dunfort. It is true, as well, that he managed to scale the walls of the Dunfort in turn, killing a guard on the wall walk before he could raise the alarm. Then, by stealth and courage, he found his way to the dungeon where the king was being kept. By the time he had Ares Targaryen out of the dungeon, however, the king's absence had been noted, and the hue and cry went up. And then the true breath of Sir Barristan's heroism was revealed, for he stood and fought, rather than surrender himself or the king. Not only did he fight, but he struck first, taking Lord Darkland's good brother and master-at-arms, Sir Simon Hollard, who is related to Dantos Hollard, and a pair of guards, unawares, slaying them all, and so avenging the death of his sworn brother, Sir Gawain Gaunt of the King's Guard, who had been killed at Hollard's hand. So this is... He hurried with the king to the stables, fighting his way through those who tried to intervene, and the two were able to ride out of the Dunfort before the castle's gates could be closed. Then there was a wild ride through the streets of Duskendale while horns and trumpets sounded the alarm and the race up to the walls as Lord Tywin's archers attempted to clear it of defenders. Okay, so this is some James Bond stuff, right? Here's the interesting thing. Think about Quentin Martell. Quentin Martell was sent to Meereen on a secret mission. And then he, he turned it into something almost like this, trying to steal the dragons out of the pyramid in the middle of the night is very similar to what Barristan is doing, trying to sneak into the Dunfort and steal a dragon. But this time he's not stealing an actual dragon, he's stealing a dragon king. So Barristan the Bold... He's just the kind of guy that you would want, okay? He's the guy that could pull this off. Like I said, what if they had sent um, the Red Viper instead of Quentin? He might have had a chance at making it to Marine and assessing that situation and coming up with a spontaneous plan to turn it to his advantage when he found out that he couldn't marry Danny. Quentin didn't know what to do. Okay, so Quentin... Now, the, the ironic thing is that the, the end of Quentin's attempt to rescue the dragons, or to steal the dragons, his dead body, he gives his last breath right in front of Barristan, a guy who pulled off something like this successfully in his youth. So when he looks at Quentin and he's just like, I get it, like the boldness, you know, Congratulations for the boldness, but you are not, you, not everyone is barristed to tell me. So, yeah. Interesting comparison, isn't it? And of course, we just did the uh, the Quentin stream. If you haven't seen that, you can find that on uh, in the videos, in the playlists. 
list. We just did that a few weeks ago. Let me put, I'm going to put Cleo on the tree. Hang on a second, guys. Come here. All right, she's a cute medium-sized parrot, really. Okay, so... Tywin's archers cleared the wall of defenders. The king is rescued. With the king escaped and safe, there was nothing left for Lord Darkland save surrender. But it is doubtful he knew the terrible revenge that the king intended. <laughs> Indeed. And this is the picture that we're looking at now. When Darkland and his family were presented to him in chains, Ares demanded their deaths, and not only Darkland's immediate kin, but his uncles and aunts, and even distant kiss kinsmen in Duskendale. And that includes House Hollard. Even his good kin, the Hollards, were a, that's like a cadet branch, uh, were tainted and destroyed. Only Sir Simon's young nephew, Dantos Hollard, was spared. And only then, because Sir Barristan begged that mercy as a boon, and the king he had saved could not refuse him. So, very interesting little butterfly flapping its wings across the world moment here. Dantos Hollard spared, and then he comes around and obviously plays a huge role. Spiriting Sansa from King's Landing, and of course he's actually just a tool of Peter Baelish there, but yeah, he plays a huge role. And in fact, um, it is when Joffrey orders him to be executed. And that's what, a big moment for Sansa too, when she step, speaks up for him. The Hound then steps in to cover for Sansa. And that's kind of the beginning of the Hound and Sansa's trajectory as well. So there's some definite sliding doors here with Sir Dantos. Um, and it all goes back to Barristan who is again around in King's Landing to see Sansa at court with Joffrey. So these through lines are very interesting here. And this is why I was saying this, this is good stuff to read. It really sets up the main story in a lot of ways. You can see this little tangled web being woven. So Dantos Holler despaired. As to Lady Sorella, hers was a crueler death, which we shall not read. There was torture and mutilation. And... Um, she, her enemies say that she should have suffered worse for the ruin she brought down upon the town. Now, to whatever extent, Lord, the Lord of Duskendale and his wife were, I mean, they, uh, to whatever extent his wife was down with the plan, okay? These people, the people, these people are culpable. I mean, they launched a rebellion against the crown for selfish means and brought down the expected repercussions so just like in the real world multiple things are true at the same time is Ares cruelty and genocide and murder justified no of course not um was it the predictable response to duskendale's defiance yes it was so everybody gets blamed here um the people who provoked the response and Ares for being cruel and that's what we've got so I, it's impossible to know how much Lord Duskendale was influenced by his wife. Uh, we don't, it doesn't really matter. Like at the end of the day, Lord of Duskendale is the one holding the bag, but she was tortured and it was awful. And I'm just not going to read the details. So it's up on the screen if you want to see it. Captivity at Duskendale had shattered. Whatever sanity had remained to Ares the Second Targaryen. From that day forth, the king's madness reigned unchecked growing worse with every passing year. And, well, it'll, okay. So the Darklands had dared lay hands upon his person, shoving him roughly, stripping him of his royal raiment, even daring to strike him. After his release, King Ares would no longer allow himself to be touched, even by his own servants. Uncut and unwashed, his hair grew ever longer. Let's find a good... There we go. Let's see. Um, where were we? 
His hair grew ever longer and more tangled whilst his fingernails lengthened and thickened into grotesque yellow talons. He forbade any blade in his presence save for the swords carried by the Knights of the King's Guard sworn to protect him. His judgments, judgments became ever more harsh and cruel. So look, um, six months is how long it lasted. I thought it's maybe going to say that in the next paragraph. Um, yeah, so look, yeah, it was six months. Um, we don't know how rough they were to him, but Ares is clearly, um, Ares is like, uh, obviously unstable. We've seen that he's paranoid about people. Okay. So he probably has a thing about being touched. It's not hard to imagine. And now it, all of his, like his little bubble of security that he's had. And this is part of like power corrupting and stuff. When you're the prince and you're the king, you're not challenged enough. And so things that you should have overcome and dealt with and had brought to the surface so you could deal with them in painful but productive fashion are just left to fester and simmer, right? And so six months of trauma and like this guy that has had this bubble of no one questions him, no one touches him. He can order everyone to, you know, he keeps his wife locked up. He's just paranoid as hell. And then he's just like handled like, um, my mods are horrendous. What's going on? I, my mods are awesome. I'm confident in my mods. There's someone giving my mods, uh, issues the issue is probably theirs but i don't have time to, to 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 scroll back and moderate it all so i'm just gonna let my mods do their job thank you northern tommy so um let's see here what i was saying was that um this is this is an incredible trauma for aries someone who is paranoid and sensitive and kind of erratic and now he's being handled roughly and treated like a prisoner. And it just freaks him out. He comes out of this completely freaked out and just overreacts um, in, you know, to everything. We've already seen he's cruel, but now it's just going to be worse. So <clears throat> this is instability and insanity mixed with trauma. Now we've got we've got everything. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Where are we? Once safely returned to King's Landing, His Grace refused to leave the Red Keep for, <laughs> for any cause, Cleo. I'm sorry. Do you want to come back over here? She does. She does want to come back over here. For any cause and remained a virtual prisoner in his own castle for the next four years, during which time he grew ever more wary of those around him. <clears throat> Tywin Lannister in particular. His suspicions <laughs> extended even to his own son and heir, Prince Rhaegar. He was convinced. Um, his own son and heir, period. Prince Rhaegar, he was convinced, had conspired with Tywin Lannister to have him slain at Duskendale. They had planned to storm the town walls so that Lord Darklyn would put him to death, opening the way for Rhaegar to mount the Iron Throne and marry Lord Tywin's daughter. Gee, I wonder why Ares thought that. Why do you think? Because Tywin literally said that when they were like, but what if they murder the king? He was like, yeah, big, big whoop. We'll just make Rhaegar king. The guy that's still unmarried, who I suggested should marry my daughter a couple years ago. Maybe, maybe he'll be king and marry my daughter. Like, yeah, he's, Ares is definitely insane and cruel, but he's not wrong about this. <laughs> the only thing we don't know is what, what, how did Rhaegar feel about it? We don't know that. Rhaegar may have been horrified when uh, Tywin said that. Be like, oh my God. But it's not recorded that he confronted Tywin or said, you better save my father or else when I'm king, I'll have you put to death. Rhaegar could have said that. He's the crown prince. 
he literally could have said to Tywin, if my father is dead, you're dead too. It'll mean your head. He could have said that. And that would have been recorded because again, this is in council around all the, the you know, the cabinet, basically, the, the, the small council. There's nothing recorded that Rhaegar chastised Tywin. He should have. That was kind of a treasonous statement. Tywin should not have been able to say that. So I think it's pretty likely that Rhaegar was at least like, hmm, hmm, <laughs> right? Hard to say, hard to say. Okay, so um, let's see, where are we? Determined to prevent that from happening, King Ares turned to another friend of his childhood, summoning Stefan Baratheon from Storm's End and naming him to the small council. In 278, the king sent Lord Stefan across the Narrow Sea on a mission to Old Belantis to seek a suitable bride for Prince Rhaegar. Oh, yes, the patch facing. Let's see, a suitable bride for Prince Rhaegar, quote, a maid of noble birth from an old Valyrian bloodline that his grace entrusted this task to the Lord of Storm's End rather than his hand or Rhaegar himself speaks volumes. The rumors were rife that Ares meant to make Lord Stefan his new hand um, upon the successful completion of the mission. That Tywin Lannister was about to be removed from office, arrested and tried for high treason. And there was many a lord who took delight in that prospect. So, Patchface is the suitable bride for Prince Rhaegar. Yep, well, that's who they brought back. <laughs> that's who they brought back. <clears throat> so, uh, let's see here. This is interesting. Um, Ares attempting to arrange... A betrothal for Rhaegar is not suspicious on the surface. He's supposed to do that. He should have done that already. And he refused Tywin and called him a servant. So if he marries Rhaegar to some other daughter of a high lord, that would be kind of silly. I mean, he might do that, but what does he do? He seeks a woman of Valerian blood from Essos. So it's kind of like the most racist answer. <laughs> It's the most Valerian supremacist answer, right? Um, and it also seems like a way of trying to control Rhaegar. Like, that's what he's doing. He doesn't, he's like, oh, Tywin and Rhaegar are plotting and they're going to marry Rhaegar to Cersei. Well, I'm going to marry Rhaegar to someone of my choosing that I don't suspect. So it's definitely like um, a way of trying to exert control. The gods had other notions, however. Stefan Baratheon's mission ended in failure, and on his return from Belantis, his ship foundered and sank in Shipbreaker Bay within sight of Storm's End. Lord Stefan and his wife were both drowned as their two elder sons watched from the castle walls. When word of their deaths reached King's Landing, King Ares flew into a rage and told Grandmaster Pycelle that Tywin Lannister had somehow divined his royal intentions and arranged for Lord Baratheon's murder. So, Tywin controls the storms now. Everyone. I mean, it's, if I dismiss him as hand, he will kill me too, the king told the Grand Maester. I guess. Um, oh, you're saying maybe the ship was sabotaged? No, I mean, the memory is uh, that the, the, the storm was hellacious. I believe so. I mean, I guess I didn't think about that. Why do they keep sailing in a bay with that name? Are they stupid? That's fair. <laughs> That's actually fair. I'm not sure. Yeah, Tywin used the ancient weather control station that is Storm's End to create a storm and whack off Stefan. <laughs> Interesting choice of words. Careful. Um... <laughs> Yeah, all right. Well, in the years that followed, the king's madness deepened. 
Though Tywin Lannister continued as Hand, Ares no longer met with him, save in the presence of all seven Kingsguard, convinced that the small folk and lords, that's chill, right? <laughs> You're at the meeting with the king. Who are these seven guys with swords? Oh, they're just here to make sure everything's chill. Convinced that the small folk and lords were plotting against his life and fearing that even Queen Rhaella and Prince Rhaegar might be part of these plots. He reached across the narrow sea to Pentos and imported a eunuch named Varys to serve as his spy master, reasoning that only a man without friends, family, or ties in Westeros could be relied upon for the truth. So the paranoia is definitely deep. <clears throat> yeah, um, baby the bard, I am on, I support you. I'm not here for any sort of body shaming stuff at all. Just like, I think that's so, it's the year 2023. If you're calling people ugly or anything like that, just grow the F up. So I support that, support that ban. I also like my policy here, by the way, is don't be rude. If you're in the chat and you're being rude, you might get banned. Like that's just, we're nice people here and I just can't have that spoiled. The The rude people stand out really bad because everyone else is super cool. So if you roll in here edgy and rude, I might ignore it or I might ban you or somebody might ban you. It's definitely a thing that can happen. Uh, not a free speech issue either because no one's throwing you in jail and I'm in charge of the shit. So cry more if that's your angle. <laughs> like, just be nice. Be nice and you can hang out. You can disagree. Just be nice. Anyway. Be nice or go home. That's it. That's it. It's that old golden rule. So. Oh, this is where it gets fun. So uh, the spider, the spy master, the spider, as he soon became known to the small folk of the realm, used the crown's gold to create a vast web of informers. For the rest of Ares' reign, he would crouch at the king's side, whispering in his ear. In the wake of Duskendale, the king also began to display signs of an ever-increasing obsession with dragonfire. Similar to that, which had haunted several of his forebears. Lord Dark... And so, again, dragon dreams. Potentially. He probably had some in the dungeon. Like, we've seen that when people are subject to stress, sickness, the dark... All these things, sensory deprivation, the psychic powers can manifest. That's a belief in real world, uh, in, you know, amongst people in the real world who uh, believe in psychic powers or even just like meditation and stuff. Like I've seen people blindfold themselves uh, just as a way of developing their, their hearing. Uh, they do that for Arya, in fact. They blindfold Arya so that her other senses will be sharpened. That also works in like a magical context as well. Yeah, you can be raunchy in the chat as long as it's in good fun and good spirit. So, yeah, you can say pegged. That's okay. Anyway. Obsession with dragon fire. Lord Darklin would never have dared defy him if he had been a dragon rider, Ares reasoned. His attempts to bring forth dragons from eggs found in the depths of Dragonstone, some so old they had turned to stone, yield not, however. So yeah, now Ares is trying to wake dragons. That's a big clue that he's having dragon dreams. He's trying to wake dragons. It's not just an idea that Targaryens have. It's something they do when they have dreams about dragons. So frustrated, Ares turned to the, wise, the wisdoms of the ancient guild of alchemists who knew the secret of producing the volatile jade green substance known as wildfire, said to be a close cousin to dragon flame. And that's an interesting line. Um, dragon fire is magical fire. Wildfire is too. Um, the alchemists say that their spells to make wildfire have gotten stronger and more potent since the dragons have been born or since the red comet came back or whatever it is. So there does, it's not just Greek fire. There are, there does seem to be a magical component to wildfire, which would make it similar to dragonfire as a, 
some sort of fire that has a magical magical component. Yes, Varys and Ares, Grima, Wormtongue, and Theoden. Absolutely. Like, crouching at the king's side, whispering. We're supposed to think of Grima, Wormtongue. I mean, Grima, Wormtongue is like an archetype, you know, of the Whisperer. So, yeah. Anybody that's the evil counselor. I mean, it's a Rasputin thing, too. There's there's other precedent for it. But Okay, so, um, unless Greek fire was magical, eh? Eh? <laughs> Should we wonder who's behind Varys? No, nah, I think Varys is behind Varys. I think that makes sense. And I don't see anybody who is, is behind him. Unless you mean that in a different way. Okay. The Wisdoms, Alchemy. The Pyromancers became a regular fixture at the court. I guess we'll do this one. Regular fixture at the court. As the king's fascination with fire grew. By 280 AC, Ares II had taken to burning traitors, murderers, and plotters rather than hanging or beheading them. The king seemed to take great pleasure in these fiery executions. The archetype of Grima is a pawn. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, who's Grima a pawn of? Is he just Sau Sauron's mouthpiece? I didn't take it for that, but maybe I forget how that works. Anyway, no, I don't see anybody behind Varys, but I understand what you're saying. Okay, so, great pleasure in these fiery executions, I guess that's this, which were presided over by Wisdom Rossart, the Grand Maester of the Guild of Alchemists, so much so that he granted Rossart the title of Lord and gave him a seat upon the small council. He is Saruman's mouthpiece. Okay, right. Well, there is no Sauron. He's Saruman's mouthpiece. Okay, right. Yeah, well, there's no... Yeah, I don't see an equivalent to that. But um let's see here. But but thank you for explaining. I understand the the train of thought. Okay, so I mean you tell me who's but who would be behind Varys? I don't I just have no idea. I read him as a mastermind. So his grace's growing badness had become unmistakable. From Dorn to the Wall, men had begun to refer to Ares the Second as the Mad King. In King's Landing, he was called King Scab for the many times he had cut himself upon the Iron Throne. Yet with Varys the Spider and his Whisperers listening, it became very dangerous to voice any of these sentiments aloud. So this is really good writing by George. You know, fascists always descend into more fascism, right? If you're abusing your power a little bit, it generates resistance. And then you've got to silence that resistance and that begets more rebellion. And then you got to tamp them down. So now, before Ares was uh, propped up by Tywin's competency as an administrator, um, although we should assume it was heavy-handed and cruel at times, it was competent. Now he's propping himself up with informers, <laughs> a web of informants, total information awareness, big brother, torture, rule by fear, that's what he is um, turning to here. I haven't watched uh, the newest Disputed Lands video, but I will. And I'm sure I will have an opinion. So. Yet with Varys the Spider, yeah, it became very dangerous to voice any of these sentiments aloud. Meanwhile, Ares was becoming ever more estranged from his own son and heir. Early in the year 279 AC, Rhaegar Targaryen, Prince of Dragonstone, was formally betrothed to Princess Elia Martell, the delicate young sister of Doran Martell, Prince of Dorne. They were wed the following year in a lavish ceremony at the Great Sept of Baylor in King's Landing, but Ares did not attend. He told the small council he feared an attempt upon his life if he left the confines of the Red Keep, even with his King's Guard to protect him. Nor would he allow his younger son Viserys to attend his brother's wedding. When Prince Rhaegar and his new wife chose to take up residence on Dragonstone instead of the Red Keep, rumors flew thick and fast across the Seven Kingdoms. Some claimed that the Crown Prince was planning to depose his father and seize the Iron Throne for himself, whilst others said that King Ares meant to disinherit Rhaegar and name Viserys heir in his place, probably also true. Hmm. Probably both true.
So they're they're basically, yeah, it's just they're plotting against each other. So then we've got Nor did the birth of King Ares' first grandchild, a girl named Rhaenys, born on Dragonstone in 280, do aught to reconcile father and son. When Prince Rhaegar returned to the Red Keep to present his daughter to his own mother and father, Queen Rhaella embraced the babe warmly, but Ares refused to touch or hold the child and complained that she smells Dornish. So more racism from Ares. And it's weird because Ares is the one, ostensibly, who would have arranged the marriage between Rhaegar and Elia. And then he's like, ooh, Dornish. Okay. Amidst all this, Lord Tywin Lannister continued to serve as Hand of the King. Just keeps on keeping on. Lord Tywin looms as large as Casterly Rock, wrote Grand Maester Pycelle, and no king has ever had so diligent or capable a hand. And every night I pleasure myself to my... <laughs> just the fawning here is... I don't even need to finish the joke. I mean, it's just talk about a lick spittle. Seemingly secure in his office after the death of Stephen Baratheon, Lord Tywin even went so far as to bring his beautiful young daughter Cersei to court. I mean, that's a pretty normal thing to do, but okay. In 281 AC, however, the aged Kingsguard knight Sir Harlan Grandison passed away in his sleep, and the uneasy accord between Ares and his hand finally snapped. <laughs> Again, when his grace chose to offer a white cloak to Lord Tywin's eldest son. At five and ten, Sir Jamie Lannister was already a knight. An honor he had received from the hand of Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning, who many considered to be the realm's most chivalrous warrior. Jamie's knighthood had been, worn, had been won during Sir Arthur's campaign against the outlaws known as the Kingswood Brotherhood, and none could doubt his prowess. Sir Jamie was also Lord Tywin's heir, however, and carried all his hopes for the perpetuation of House Lannister. And his lordship's other son was the malformed dwarf Tyrion, who might be Ares' son. However, the Hand had been in the midst of negotiating an advantageous marriage pact for Jamie when the king informed him of his choice. At a stroke, Ares had deprived Tywin of his chosen heir and made him look foolish and false. That's kind of nuts. Um, yeah, this is definitely a slight at Tywin. And a very effective one. Um, it's kind of unthinkable. Like, you're not supposed to refuse the king, but Tywin probably should have tried to find a way to negotiate out of this, at least. Because this is his heir. Like, it's kind of insane to take him into the Kingsguard. And you see why Tywin was like just kind of assuming that Jer that uh, Jamie would be down to dissolve that at some point and just make him his heir again. So this is kind of a messed up situation here. So I think that Illyrio and Varys are just working together. I don't see that, you know, Illyrio is manipulating Varys. Like, we see a very candid conversation between them. They sound like equals and co-conspirators. So, that's how I read that. Um, guys, let me take a restroom break. It's been uh, about two and a half hours. I'll be right back.
I've been watching videos about that thing that you just saw, the cosmic microwave background, the oldest light that we've seen. Um, if anybody's into Big Bang astrophysics stuff, like not deep astrophysics, but just hearing about the theories that the physicists have, um, that James Webb telescope has been causing some chaos. And uh, there are a lot of good videos to watch both on YouTube and Curiosity Stream, which, by the way, once I do uh, a thing with somebody, those links are good forever. So even if Curiosity Stream doesn't do more ads with me, which I think they will, but even if they don't, you can always use that link to get uh, the discount. So, and of course, all my all my promo codes are Lightbringer. So, anytime you can remember that I've done a commercial with somebody, just Throw Lightbringer in there and see if it works. It probably will. Anyway, yeah, the James Webb, dude. <laughs> We're finding galaxies that are too old and... Oh, man. That stuff is so interesting. Don't get me started about super determinism and Sabine Hassenfelder, though, because I will... I will get worked up. Anyways, of course free will exists. Anyways. <laughs> okay, so where were we? Yet Grandmaster Pycelle tells us that when Ares II announced Sir Jamie's appointment from the Iron Throne, his lordship went to one knee and thanked the king for the great honor shown to his house. Then, pleading illness, Lord Tywin asked the king's leave to retire as hand. So probably what Tywin did at this point was just like, okay, note to self, accelerate plot to replace Ares. That's got to be what I was thinking. But um, we'll see. King Ares was delighted to oblige him. Lord Tywin accordingly surrendered his chain of office and retired from court, returning to Casterly Rock with his daughter. So basically, Lord Ty uh, Ares finally got tired of toying with Tywin because now he had his son to toy with. So then he's finally okay with letting him go back to Casterly Rock. Lord Ty Okay, so the king replaced him as hand with Lord Owen Merriweather, an aged and amiable lick spittle, famed for laughing loudest at every jape and witticism uttered by the king, no matter how feeble. Well, no, you do have a choice to believe in free will. And that's the thing. If you want, you could go watch Sabine Hassenfelder's video. Um, it's about to use a different word. Uh, telling you that you have no free will. And then you can decide to believe in that, that we don't have free will which is a good proof that free will does exist. The fact that she's trying to make YouTube videos that convinces people that there isn't free will is funny and ironic if she actually believes that there is no free will because then she can't convince anyone. Anyways, it's, it's paradox. It's silly. It's very silly. You don't have to be an astrophysicist to uh, understand that that is silly. Of course, most physicists don't believe in super determinism anyway. I told you not to get me started on this. I did it. You did this, Dave. You started it. Okay. Um, <laughs> it is sophistry. Thank you, Barris Aurelius. It is very, very silly. And it all arose as they're just trying to find an excuse, an explanation for spooky ac action at a distance, quantum entanglement, which doesn't make sense. It might not. We don't. We just don't understand it. It's okay. We eventually will, but we don't now. Therefore, we don't have free will. Everything was determined. The Big Bang. Anyways, it's really, it's too late for this. Thank you, Mike. It is. Okay, so Lick Spittle, Owen Merriweather, is the hand of the king. Henceforth, his grace told Pycelle, the realm would know for a certainty that the man who wore the crown was also ruling the Seven Kingdoms or something. Ares Targaryen and Tywin Lannister had met as boys, had fought and bled together in the War of the Nine Penny Kings, and had ruled the Seven Kingdoms together for close to 20 years. But in 281 AC, this long partnership which had proved so fruitful to the realm, came to a bitter end. Shortly thereafter, Lord Walter Went announced plans for a great tourney to be held at his seat at Harrenhal to celebrate his maiden daughter's name day. King Aerys II chose this event for the formal investiture of Sir Jamie Lannister as a knight of the King's Guard, thus setting in motion the events that would end the Mad King's reign and write an end to the long rule of the House Targaryen in the Seven Kingdoms. Pycelle is a complete simp for Tywin. That is the right word. Bootlicker, 
<laughs> any of that. <laughs> Okay, so the year of the fall spring. Um, some of this is about Ares. Some of it is more about Rhaegar. So I will read parts of this. Uh, but there is a couple of very important passages here that we definitely need. So in 281, 281 is known as the year of the fall spring. Winter had held the land in its icy grip for close on two years. But now, at last, the snows were melting. The woods were greening. The days were growing longer. Though the white ravens had not yet flown, there were many even at the citadel of Old Town who believed the winter's end was nigh. So the days are growing longer is interesting here. So if the days are growing longer, and again, we don't know what governs the cycle of the seasons in Westeros and how that works, what's going on with that. It's magical. It'll probably have a quasi understandable explanation, but it'll be somewhat magical also. But if the days are growing longer, that does mean that it is moving out of winter and into summer. But then there's this cold snap. So I'm not sure if that's just a, a storm or if the actual seasons are reversing again and the days start getting shorter again. But the, the maesters of Old Town supposedly measure the length of the days and that's how they determine the seasons. So the days are growing longer but the maesters have not yet said that it is spring. So it's kind of interesting little glimpse into the how this works here. I don't think we have enough information to draw any conclusions, but it is interesting. So as warm winds blew from the south, lords and knights from throughout the Seven Kingdoms made their way toward Harrenhal to compete in Lord Wendt's great tournament on the shore of God's Eye, which... Promised to be the largest and most magnificent competition since the time of Aegon the Unlikely. We know a great deal about that tourney, for things that transpired beneath the walls of Harrenhal were set down by a score of chroniclers and recorded in many a letter and testament. Yet, there is much more that we will never know, for even while the greatest knights of the Seven Kingdoms vied in the lists, other and more dangerous games were being played in the halls of Black Heron's castle. A cursed castle, excuse me. And the tents and pavilions of the lords assembled. And we know those tents definitely saw some action. Many tales have grown up around Lord Wendt's tournament. Tales of plots and conspiracies, betrayals and rebellions, infidelities and assignations. I don't even know what that means. Secrets and mysteries. Almost all of it conjecture. The truth is known only to a few, some of whom have long passed away. Blah, blah, blah. This is known. The tourney was first announced by Walter Wendt. In late in the year of 280 AC, not long after a visit from his younger brother, Sir Oswell Went, one of the Kingsguard who was at the Tower of Joy, so this is a very Rhaegar loyal Kingsguard, visits Harrenhal. Then they call the tourney. That this would be an event of unrivaled magnificence was clear from the first, for Lord Went was offering prizes thrice as large as those given at the Great Lannisport tourney of 272 AC, hosted by Lord Tywin. Uh, in celebration of Ares II's 10th year on the throne. <clears throat> Most took this simply as an attempt by Went to outdo his former hand and demonstrate the wealth and splendor of his house. There were those, however, who believed that this was no more than a ruse and that Lord Went was no more than a cat's paw. His lordship lacked the funds to pay such magnificent prizes, they argued. Someone else must surely have stood behind him, someone who did not lack for gold, but preferred to remain in the shadows whilst allowing the Lord of Harrenhal to claim the glory for hosting this magnificent event. We have no shred of evidence that such a shadow host ever existed, but the notion was widely believed at the time and remains so today. But if there was such a shadow, who was he? Blah, blah, blah. Only one name seems compelling, Rhaegar Targaryen. If this tale be believed, twas the Prince Rhaegar, who urged Lord Walter to hold the tourney using his lordship's brother Sir Oswal as a go-between. Rhaegar provided Went with gold, sufficient for splendid prizes, in order to bring as many lords and knights to Harrenhal as possible. The prince, it is said, had no interest in the tourney as attorney. His intent was to gather the great lords of the realm together in what amounted to an informal great council in order to discuss ways and means of dealing with the madness of his father, King Aerys II, possibly by means of a regency or forced abdication. If indeed this was the purpose behind the tourney, 
Uh, then Rhaegar must have forgotten all about it because he never did that. <laughs> That's what's weird about this. It's very believable that this was what was going on at Hall. But Rhaegar didn't do it. We know most of the High Lords that opposed Ares. It's Robert and Ned and Brandon and Rickard and all them. Like, we never hear about it. They, they don't, it doesn't happen. Like we have, it does, it just doesn't seem like Rhaegar did it. I mean, the most he would have done were like, sowed the seeds for it. He wasn't having an informal great council. He might have talked to people. Yeah. Ares showed up. I don't really think that would have, that only would have helped his case. Well, let me read on and you'll see why. If indeed this was the purpose behind the tourney, it was a perilous game that Rhaegar was playing. Though few doubted that Ares had taken leave of his senses, many still had good reason to oppose his removal from the throne, for certain courtiers and counselors had gained, ga uh, gained great wealth and power through the king's caprice, and knew that they stood to lose all should Prince Rhaegar come to power. The Mad King could be savagely cruel, as seen most plainly when he burned those he perceived to be his enemies, but he could also be extravagant, showering men with gold and honors and offices and lands. The Lickspittle lords who surrounded Ares had gained much and more from the king's madness and eagerly seized upon any opportunity to speak ill of Rhaegar and inflame the father's suspicions of the son. Chief among the Mad King's supporters were three lords of his small council. Carlton Chelstead, Master of Coin, Lucerys Valarion, Master of Ships, and Simon Staunton, Master of Laws. The eunuch Varys, Master of Whisperers, and Wisdom Rossart, Grand Master of the Guild of Alchemists, also enjoyed the King's trust. Prince Rhaegar's support came from the younger men at court, including John Connington, Sir Miles Mouton of Maidenpool, and Sir Richard Lonmouth. The Dornishmen who had come to court with the Princess Elia were in the prince's confidence as well, particularly Prince Lewin Martell, Elia's uncle and a sworn brother of the Kingsguard. But the most formidable of all Rhaegar's friends and allies in King's Landing was surely Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning. So Rhaegar's friends are Kingsguard, three of them at least. You know, Lewin, Arthur Dane, Oswa Went, and possibly Gerald Hightower too, because he was at the Tower of Joy. So then we've got, let's see, to Grand Maester Pycelle and Lord Owen Merriweather, the King's Hand, fell the unenviable task of keeping peace between these factions, even as their rivalry grew ever more venomous. In a letter to the Citadel, Pycelle wrote that the divisions within the Red Keep reminded him uncomfortably of the situation before the Dance of the Dragons a century before. And we saw it on TV. It was just like this. You know, so. When the... Oh, got to click back on the window. When the enmity between Queen Alicent and Princess Rhaenyra had split the realm in two to grievous cost, a similarly bloody conflict might await the Seven Kingdoms once again. Yeah, it had nothing to do with Otto. It's just, you know, catfight between Alicent and Rhaenyra. A similarly bloody conflict might await the Seven Kingdoms once again, he warned, unless some accord could be reached that would satisfy both Prince Rhaegar's supporters and the kings. Oh, did I miss a golden shower? Oh, showering with gold and lances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had any whiff of proof come into the hands to show that Prince Rhaegar was conspiring against his father, King Ares' loyalists would most certainly have used it to bring about the prince's downfall. Indeed, certain of the king's men had even gone so far as to suggest that Ares should disinherit his, quote, disloyal son and name his younger brother heir to the Iron Throne in his stead. Prince Viserys was but seven, and his eventual ascension would certainly mean a regency, wherein they themselves would rule as regents. <laughs> in such a climate, it was scarce. Surprising that Lord Wendt's great tourney excited much suspicion. Lord Chelstead urged his grace to forbid it, and Lord Staunton went even further. 
suggesting a prohibition against all attorneys. Such events were widely popular with the commons, however, and when Lord Merriweather, Merriweather warned Ares that forbidding the tournament would only serve to make him more unpopular, the king chose another course and announced his intention to uh, attend. It would mark the first time that Ares II had left the safety of the Red Cape a red keep since the defiance of Duskendale. Okay, so he's literally been holed up in the red keep since then. No doubt his grace reasoned that his enemies would not dare conspire against him under his very nose. Grandmaster Picel tells us that Ares hoped his presence at such a grand event would help him win back the love of his people. So if you're asking the question, did he do a makeover? Little fit for public consumption makeover before he went? No, answer's no. If that was indeed the king's intent, it was a grievous miscalculation. Whilst his attendance made the Heron Hall tourney even grander and more prestigious than it already was, drawing lords and knights from every corner of the realm, many of those who came were shocked and appalled when they saw what had become of their monarch. His long yellow fingernails, tangled beard, and ropes of unwashed matted hair, which were probably all dreaded up in the worst way possible, <clears throat> come here, go made the extent of the king's madness plain to all. Nor was his behavior that of a sane man, for Ares could go from mirth to melancholy in the blink of an eye, and many of the accounts written of Hall speak of his hysterical laughter, long silences, bouts of weeping, and sudden rages. Hey, it sounds like me sometimes when I... Actually, no, not really. Just a little bit. But, <laughs> nah, for real, he's crazy. And uh, he showed up at the tourney and freaked everyone out. So this is why I was saying, if Rhaegar is trying to gather support for overthrowing Ares or deposing him in a gentle, peaceful way with a nice little locked tower cell to live out his life in, padded cell, of course, um, this would be great. Like, what, what better, what a stroke of luck for Ares to show up and show everyone just how crazy he is. That works right into his hands. And Ares out of the castle is probably easier to take. Like if you want to go ahead and hold the vote and make the move, like he's going to be less protected at this tourney than he would be in the Red Keep with all the city watch and soldiers of King's Landing there. But no move was made. So, I don't know if Rhaegar was planning to, and then he had the you know had a dream about Lyanna and Prince that was promised, and decided to go do that instead. But he did not. I mean, if he was trying to depose Ares, he had all the pieces right there. That's all I'm saying. Ares showing up would have played right into. His hands. Yeah, they could have arranged for an accident somewhere. And Rhaegar has good friends in the King's Guard, too. So, I don't know. Ares holds a press conference at Four Seasons Landscaping. This should do it. <laughs> yeah, Ares' attire was Four Seasons Landscaping. That's That's very true. Okay, so... Um, okay. Ares is crazy. He's at the tourney. He's not winning friends. Above all, King Ares II was suspicious. Suspicious of his own son and heir, Prince Rhaegar. Suspicious of his host, Lord Went. Suspicious of every lord and knight who would come to Heron Hall to compete. And even more suspicious of those who chose to absent themselves. The most notable of whom was his former hand, Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock. At the tourney's opening ceremony, King Ares made a great public show of Sir Jamie Lannister's investiture as a sworn brother of the Kingsguard. The young knight said his vows before the royal pavilion, kneeling on the green grass in his white armor as half the lords of the realm looked on. When Sir Gerald Hightower, Gerald Hightower raised him up and clasped the white cloak about his shoulders, a roar went up for the crowd, for Sir Jamie was much admired for his courage, gallantry, and prowess with the sword, especially in the Westerlands and also because he hadn't genocided anyone yet, like Ares and Tywin. Though Tywin Lannister did not himself deign to attend the tourney at Hall, 
Dozens of his lord's banners and hundreds of his knights were on hand, and they raised a loud and lusty cheer for the newest and youngest sworn brother of the Kingsguard. Yeah, see, lusty, again, doesn't mean that they all literally wanted to Jamie. Although maybe a lot of them did, you know. But it just means the cheer was, was randy, it was lusty, it was healthy, robust. So, in his madness, we are told that Grace, his grace believed that they were cheering for him. Scarce had the thing been done, however, that King Ares began to nurse grave doubts about his new protector. The king had seized upon the notion of bringing Sir Jamie into his king's guard as a way of humbling his old friend. Uh, Grand Maester Pycelle tells us, only now, belatedly, did his grace come to the realization that he would henceforth have Lord Tywin's son beside him day and night, with a sword at his side. The thought frightened him so badly, Cleo. It frightened... Hey, Cleo, come here. Hi, good girl. It frightened him so badly that he could scarcely eat at the night's feast, Pycelle avows. Accordingly, Ares II summoned Sir Jamie to attend him while squatting over his chamber pot, some say, but this ugly detail may have been a later addition to the tale. That sounds true to me. And commanded him to return to King's Landing to guard and protect Queen Rhaella and Prince Viserys, who had not accompanied his grace to the tourney. The Lord Commander Sir Gerald Hightower offered to go in Jamie's stead, but Ares refused him. For the young knight, who had no doubt hoped to distinguish himself in the tourney, this abrupt exile came as a bitter disappointment. Nonetheless, Sir Jamie remained true to his vows. He set off for the Red Keep at once and played no further part in the events at Harrenhal, save perhaps in the mind of the Mad King. For seven days, the finest knights and noblest lords of the Seven Kingdoms contended with lance and sword. Blah, blah, blah. Some tales were... Okay, blah, blah, blah. Here. There's two events that are interesting. The first was the appearance of a mystery knight, a slight young man, <clears throat> <clears throat> Leanna, in ill fitting armor whose device was a carved white weirwood tree. Um, let's see, its features twisted in mirth. The Knight of the Laughing Tree, as this challenger was called, unhorsed three men in successive tilts to the, to the delight of the commons. Of course, we know that whole story. And we talked about that in the recent Leanna stream, if you want that one. King Ares II was not a man to take any joy in the mysteries. In mysteries, however, his grace became convinced that the tree on the Mystery Knight's shield was laughing at him. And with no more proof than that, decided that the Mystery Knight was Jamie. His newest king's guard had defied him and returned to the tourney, he told every man who would listen. Furious, he commanded his own knights to defeat the Knight of the Laughing Tree when the joust resumed the next morning, so that he might be unmasked and his perfidy exposed for all to see. But the mystery knight vanished during the night, never to be seen again. This too the king took ill, certain that someone close to him had given warning to, quote, this traitor who will not show his face. Prince Rhaegar emerged as the ultimate victor at the end of the competition. The crown prince, who did not normally compete in tourneys, surprised all by donning his armor and defeating every foe he faced, including four knights of the Kingsguard, who all took dives to make Rhaegar look good. In the final tilt, he unhorsed Sir Barristan Selmy, generally regarded as the finest lance in all seven kingdoms, to win the champion's laurels. Oh, no. No, he didn't. Um, we're in Barristan's POV. He remembers this event. He did not take a dive. So, no, I'm kidding. Rhaegar was really good at jousting. The cheers of the crowd were said to be deafening, but King Ares did not join them. Far from being proud and pleased by his heir's skill at arms, his grace saw it as a threat. You see a, a thread here. <laughs> He's paranoid of everything. Someone leaves, it's bad. Someone's there, it's bad. <laughs> so... Let's see here. Lord Chelstead and Staunton inflamed his suspicions further, declaring that Rhaegar had entered the lists to curry favor with the commons and remind the assembled lords that he was a puissant warrior, a true heir to Aegon the Conqueror. That part makes sense to me. It's a good move, politically. I mean, it's the thing is that if Ares wasn't paranoid, that would be just a good move for the crown to demonstrate to the realm that the prince is strong. But Ares interprets as an attack against him because he is paranoid and has let himself become at odds with his own son. 
So, when the triumphant prince of Dragonstone named Lyanna Stark, daughter of the Lord of Winterfell, <clears throat> daughter of the Lord of Winterfell, the Queen of Love and Beauty, placing a garland of blue roses in her lap with the tip of his lance, the Lickspittle lords gathered around the king declared that the, uh, that further proof of his perfidy. Uh, let's see. Why would the prince have thus given insult to his own wife, the Princess Elliot Martell of Dorne, who was present, unless it was to help him gain the Iron Throne, the crowning of the Stark girl, who was by all reports a wild and boyish thing with none of the none of Prince Elliot's delicate beauty, could only have been meant to win the allegiance of Winterfell to Prince Rhaegar's cause, Simon Staunton suggested to the king. Yet if this were true, why did Lady Lyanna's brother seem so distraught at the honor the prince had bestowed upon her? Brandon Stark, the heir to Winterfell, had to be restrained from confronting Rhaegar at what he took to be a slight upon his sister's honor. Hey, okay, you're going over here. You can't be on the laptop, girl. You know that. It's always been the rule. Spite bite. Okay, so... Yep, Starks aren't happy. For Lyanna Stark had long been betrothed to Robert Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End. Eddard Stark, Brandon's younger brother and a close friend to Lord Robert, was calmer, but no more pleased. As for, yeah, put the Cleo emojis in there, it's worth it. As for Robert Baratheon himself, some say he laughed at the prince's gesture, claiming that Rhaegar had done no more than pay Lyanna her due. But those who knew him better say the young lord brooded on the insult and that his heart hardened toward the Prince of Dragonstone from that day forth. That seems like Robert. To, to, to laugh it off, to try to save face, but then be really pissed about it. That's absolutely what Robert did. And well it might, for with that simple garland of pale blue roses, Rhaegar Targaryen had begun the dance that would rip the Seven Kingdoms apart, bring about his own death, and thousands more. Okay, so... We talked about a lot of this stuff in the Lyanna stream as far as what Rhaegar was doing. I definitely think that Rhaegar had a dream, a prophetic dream. He, we know that he was found the prince that was promised prophecy. He was talking about it with Elia before he ever met Lyanna. So we know that he's looking for the prince that was promised. And it's pretty obvious that him and Lyanna were doing stuff according to prophecy, at least to some extent. They probably fell in love around the prophetic need of the situation. But yes, my opinion is that Rhaegar is primarily motivated by a dream that he had. That's how he knew to spot Lyanna. And I'm guessing that, that Elia didn't... Elia, and not only Elia, but no Dornish have ever had a problem with Rhaegar. And the reason, almost certainly, is because this was supposed to be a po polygamous arrangement. You know, just like Aegon married Visenya and Rhaenys, I don't think that Rhaegar ever annulled his marriage to Elia. He was going to marry both. We we were been we that's been spelled out because Elia only had two kids, and the Maesters were like, she can't have any more. And we see this scene where Rhaegar is sitting with Elia, going, "There must be one more. Three heads has the dragon." So it's not hard to figure out what happened there. But check out the Lyanna stream for that whole thing. I'm going to skip through some of this now to get to the Ares stuff. Let's see. Yeah, the annulment is silly. I don't know why the show went that way. It's really dumb. Uh, let's see here. So the fall spring ends. Um, everything turns cold. This is symbolism. Rhaegar runs off with Lyanna. It's Night's Queen stuff. Then it gets cold. It's icy. Icy winds hammer the city. He has pyromancers lighting fires on the walls, which is obvious parallel to the night's watch and lighting fire on the walls. Uh, let's see. Carries off Lyanna, blah, blah, blah. So there's a little bit more during Robert's rebellion. And again, we're going to do a very detailed Robert's rebellion in a couple of weeks, probably a month. But there is something else here about Ares that is very interesting. Well, he, the murder of uh, Rickard and Brandon, first of all. 
So after the Battle of the Trident happens, <clears throat> when the news reached the Red Keep, it was said that Ares cursed the Dornish, certain that Lewin had betrayed Rhaegar. He sent his pregnant queen, Rhaella, and his younger son, a new heir of Aceres, away to Dragonstone. But Princess Elia was forced to remain in King's Landing with Rhaegar's children as a hostage against Dorne. Having burned his previous hand, Lord Chelstead, alive for bad counsel during the war, Lord Chelstead, who was a lickspittle, loyal to Ares, still got burnt. Ares now appointed another to the position of hand, the alchemist Rossert, a man of low birth with little to recommend him but his flames and trickery. Man. Sir Jamie was meanwhile left in charge of the Red Keep's defenses. The walls were manned by knights and watchmen awaiting the enemy. When the first army that arrived flew the Lion of Casterly Rock with Lord Tywin at its head, King Ares anxiously ordered the gates to be opened, thinking that at last his old friend and former hand had come to his rescue, as he had done at the Defiance of Duskendale, although that's not what Tywin did at Duskendale, it doesn't look like. He probably tried to get Ares killed and didn't expect Barristan to succeed, but then Barristan did. <clears throat> but Lord Tywin had not come to save the Mad King. No, why would he? Like, why would he at this point? This time, Lord Tywin's cause was that of the realms. Oh, yes, Tywin's cause is that of the realms, not the mountain of hatred and resentment 20 years deep that he has been building up against Ares. That didn't have anything to do with it. His cause was the realms. And he was determined to bring an end to the realm, uh, to the reign of madness. Uh, he was determined to bring an end to the reign that madness had brought low. Once within the walls of the city, his soldiers assaulted the, the defenders of King's Landing and the blood ran red in the streets. A hand-picked cadre of men raced to the Red Keep to storm its walls and seek out Ares, so that justice might be done. So look, this is where the unbelievable Tywin revisionism takes place. So first of all, the city was brutally sacked. Tywin's soldiers did not just assault the defenders of King's Landing. The, bloods, the blood ran red in the streets with the blood of all kinds of people. Rape and murder. That's what sack is. It means the soldiers stop worrying about the fighting and they just roam around and do horrible things. So that's just erased here in this account. Tywin, and it, even they use the word justice again. A handpicked cadre of men raced to the Red Keep so that justice might be done. This is the mountain and Elia Martell that they're about to talk about. The Red Keep was soon breached, but in the chaos, misfortune soon fell upon Elia of Dorne and her children, Rhaenys and Aegon. It is tragic that the blood spilled in war may as readily be innocent as it is guilty, and that those who ravished and murdered Princess Elia escaped justice. It is not known who murdered Princess Rhaenys in her bed or smashed the infant Prince Aegon's head against a wall. Some whisper it was done at Ares' own command when he learned that Lord Lannister had taken up Robert's cause, while others suggest that Elia did it herself for fear of what would happen to her children in the hands of her dead husband's enemies. So, the Picel account, oh, I've got no idea who did that. Maybe it was Elia who did it. Or maybe it was Ares. Like, no, we know who did it. It was Tywin's soldiers led by the mountain, Gregor Clegane. It's well known. It's like, this is just some wild stuff. Some wild stuff. And you see other times, it's like, oh, many people said that Tywin had a minstrel play the reigns of Castamere, but we can dismiss that. And here they're like, ah, oh, maybe it was this rumor. Maybe it was that rumor. We love rumors. What if these rumors are true? It was Antifa, right?
30 seconds. I'll be right back. I'm going to put the cockatoo back. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, so <clears throat> no idea who did any of that stuff. Ares's hand, Rossert, was killed at a postern gate after cravenly attempting to flee the castle. Um, he was killed by Jamie. For some reason, that's not mentioned. We know who killed Rossert. It was Jamie. It's, it's like one of those police headlines. Suspect dies while being confronted by police who drew guns. It's like, oh, you mean the, the cops shot somebody? <laughs> the whole passive voice thing. <laughs> he was killed at a postern gate. I don't know. I'm not sure who did it. <laughs> After cravenly attempting to flee the castle. No, he wasn't attempting to flee the castle. He was, he was sent by Ares to go blow up King's Landing. That's what he was doing. Funny stuff. Funny stuff. Uh, and the last of all to die was King Ares himself at the hand of his remaining Kingsguard knight, Sir Jamie Lannister. Like his father, Sir Jamie did as he thought best for the realm, bringing an end to the Mad King. Now, while, again, the author is pro-Lannister here, I do agree, obviously, that Jamie killing Ares was the right thing to do. Whatever you think about Jamie's motives, he had a decision. Either let Ares blow up King's Landing or not. And he chose not. So I'm, I'm, I think that's the best thing that Jamie ever did. Even if, you know, his motives are, well, they're complex to unpack. But yeah, this they got right. And so ended both the reign of House Targaryen and Robert's Rebellion, the war that put an end to nearly 300 years of Targaryen rule. And I think I somehow missed the part where, um, uh, where uh, they burned Rickard and Brandon. Where was that? That was another one where um, they didn't quite give us the details. Let's see here. Torn M. I guess we'll go back for that when we do the uh, Roberts Rebellion. But you guys know what happened. You know, he said fire is the champion of House Targaryen. And he's got Rickard hanging in his armor under a fire and Brandon has a noose around his neck. So if he tries to help his dad, he strangles and they both die horribly. And yeah, you know, Aries stuff. Um, we all know that tale. I thought it was more important to go back and highlight all this other stuff that happened before Duskendale. Like when he decided that one of his stillbirth stillborn children was the fault of his mistress whom then he then tortured and killed her whole family while at the same time projecting his infidelity onto his wife and blaming her for being unfaithful so like that was all going on before duskendale so clearly duskendale was a trauma that just like broke his brain open but there was a lot going on before that, he was not just a quote normal king. So, I have a few PayPal's that I have not answered that I will take now. And you guys can also get in any last questions you have. 
and I'll, I'll percolate some closing thoughts on Aries. I think we've, we've hit most of the points I wanted to. Um, Ron says, do dragon dreams drive eggs hatching? I think a lot of them, yes. A lot of the dragon dreams involve hatching eggs. Danny's are literally about um, eggs hatching. And then sometimes a dragon egg hatching turns out to be metaphorical and refer to a Targaryen person. So yeah, that seems to be the language of the dreams. And I think a lot of the dragon dreams, like when Danny has a dragon dream, it seems like actual communication between her and the unborn spirit of the dragon in the egg. And I believe that that is why placing the eggs in the cradles works so well. Even before the egg hatches, it's going to be psychically bonding with the child just as Danny is having dreams of Drogon before Drogon is even born. So will we see a repeat of Rickard, the Rickard Brandon murder in the main story? Gosh, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. I'm not sure. I mean, if you could come up with a scenario, I, I can give you an opinion on it. Kelly's asking, was it the children or blood Raven that used weather magic to sink the ship because they wanted the Targ Stark bloodline for the prince that was promised not a Valerian offshoot, the same kind of weather magic that repeals intruders from the Isle of Faces. I think it was just a storm, and I don't think children make storms either. So it's either Blood Raven or it was just a storm. But I'm very, I'm I'm reluctant to just blame things on Blood Raven. There's no clue there. It's just a storm. Like, where's the clue about Blood Raven in the passage? I feel like that's how George writes. If we're supposed to see a mystery, there will be clues. So show me the word clue that is suggesting it was Blood Raven. And then you'll you'll have my ear. And I don't say that just because Lord Blood Raven is always listening and always watching. Kelly also oh, I can see that I looked at that one. There was another one I missed. Oh, looks like we're up to date. Okay. Danny's dragon dreams helped her bond with dragons before they hatched and quickened them. Yeah, that's that's my opinion, exactly. Ziggy Star Dave. Yeah, that's me. So yeah, last questions. If you guys comments or questions, throw them at me and I'll take them now. But I think um, I think the tale of Ares is pretty easy to follow. You know, um, you can see his tendencies. You can see what happened to him. And you can see kind of how it all went. Uh, and really, it's like this really interesting dance between Tywin and Ares, who, again, are two different kinds of very violent people people bordering on sociopathy or psychopathy or something like that. They're completely different people, but they are both incredibly violent and in very lacking in empathy. Um, they're both monsters. And one, one looks more like a monster than the other, but they are both equally monstrous. So I will look forward very much into diving into Tywin fully two weeks from now. Uh, but in case you missed it, next week is going to be a huge live stream event. It's going to be the Grey King, the next Ironborn video. It was going to be a produced video. Instead, me and Tim are going to do it as a discussion because there are so many interesting possibilities that I have unlocked with this new research. And I really would like to just kick it around with Tim and get his reaction. I have a feeling Tim will catch a couple things I didn't make the make the theory a little better so do not miss next sunday it's going to be the next ironborn video it's going to be called driftwood kings and i've got stuff that you have never heard before it is going to be fun so do not miss that and then in two weeks we'll be doing uh tywin so baby what were your questions Will we see Krakens in the next book? Um, I think so. It might only be like a little passing thing, like, oh, we hear about it or quickly see it a little bit. I don't think it'll be overly dramatic, but they'll get they'll slide in somewhere. 
Krakens are slippery. They slide in. So, And yeah, when you leave the stream, please do hit refresh and leave a comment. That really helps boost the visibility. That would be awesome. There'll be a crack in the moon coming. A crack in the moon. That's how you get moon meteors. Zelda, you're just in time for flannel thirst. It's always time. Gray West Tim, hope you're doing well, my friend. Had family engagements today. Did I see Company of the Cats recent video about Euron's visions? No, I've not I'm not familiar with that channel. I mean I've heard of it. I don't know that I've watched any of their content. Um are you recommending it? I'm always interested in Euron's visions. Particularly white fire hands lady. Do they have a new idea about hands of white fire lady? That's the one. The rest of it all makes sense to me. Hands of white fire lady, I'm not sure about. Do I think Euron will cause the wall to collapse? Yes, he will have some role in that. I think Dragonbinder Horn will be the key. He might have Danny blow it, but he'd be like sort of tricking Danny into blowing it without her knowing what it will do, if so. So yeah, he's going to be involved. Yeah, the mystery of Grey Waste Tim's name. The point is that you get Grey Wasted. That's the point. <laughs> Company of the Cat is good, says the chat. Cool. Well, I'd love to hear it. Love to hear. I appreciate all the Song of Ice and Fire channels because it's all helping the, the fandom stay alive and it's been a long time since we had a book so yeah waste is obviously his middle name no problem baby no problem i appreciate you very much who do you think was financially back in the tourney at the wentz well i mean it was either Rhaegar or nobody you know i don't think it was somebody else the thing that i'm talk the thing that i am sort of wondering about is like it makes sense to suppose that Rhaegar was a, was organizing, a, you know, deposing Ares. But why did why is there no visible steps taken to do that? He didn't. Yeah, we just like. Obviously, he didn't meet with the Starks and tell them what he was doing, or else Brandon wouldn't have charged into King's Landing, thinking that Lyanna abducted Rhaegar. And I love in deep geeks analysis here. He traced out the exact path on the map of how Littlefinger would have met with Brandon at the end of the crossroads and given him this idea. And it's really good analysis. I'm totally on board. <clears throat> but yeah, if Rhaegar was trying to organize a deposition of Ares, then he should have been plotting with Brandon and Rickard because they're the main, some of the main people you'd turn to. And... He was creating an alliance with Leanna, but instead him and Leanna ran off by themselves and did not tell Brandon and Ned what they were doing. So I don't know. Either Rhaegar was planning on doing this and then like completely the prophecy changed his course of action or he wasn't actually doing that yet. And it's reasonable to suppose that he was. But then there's that line to Jamie when he said, he was leaving to go to the Battle of the Trident, and he told Jamie, when I return, changes will be made. That's well after Heron Hall. <clears throat> so maybe he was like not ready to do it yet at Heron Hall. It, it still could be that he wanted to show himself as a capable warrior to be to start building that support, but he maybe wasn't making the moves yet. Talk Studios, I'm I'm looking for your comments here if you have any insight. Could Rhaegar have been more focused on prophecy and Lannister, Tullys, and others have been the backers? I just, I don't see any connection between Rhaegar and any of the forces that ended up overthrowing Ares. That's the problem. And the Tower of Joy also lines up with that, you know? Did Ashara visit Brandon in the Black Cells? That's the only possible Ashara Stark interaction that fits the timeline after Hall. 
Um, yeah, after Heron Hall. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess Ashara Dane could have been in King's Landing at that time, but never thought about that. Let's see here. Rhaegar said he intended to do something before the leaves. Uh, he leaves that hanging. Oh, yeah, he said it does no good to speak of roads not taken. Yeah, so maybe he's thinking that he maybe he missed his chance somehow. Oh, yeah, Asha is great. Asha Greyjoy. She is the favorite character for sure. Oh, we're 40 likes short of 420. Hey, look at that. If you haven't clicked like, go ahead and click like. Cool, yeah, we should do some Asha Greyjoy action soon. She has a couple of her chapters I haven't read yet. Oh, they demonetized Wayward Bride. That's right, we're gonna read Wayward Bride again sometime soon. Cool, well guys, like I said, I do have a chart video coming out this week, either Tuesday or Wednesday, probably Tuesday, and it'll be like an hour of that chart, the magic chart analysis. We only showed it for a few minutes on the stream. I did a bunch of stuff with it. So look for that video, please support it and watch it on Tuesday. And then again, next Sunday, big, big stream with the Ironborn and Grey Waste Town. So lots of stuff coming in the weeks ahead. Very excited time. I'm very focused on content right now, so. Appreciate y'all for the support. Thank you mods for stepping up keeping things clean and uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off and go take care of them birds. I need a Stannis video. Yeah, you're right. It's been a minute since we've done some Stannis. Let's see. What would be a good Stannis chapter to read? Maybe some of those dance chapters with Stannis and Asha and get into. I do love Stannis. I also, there'll be a Peter Baelish Sansa characters thing coming soon too. That one's in the hopper. Demonetization, uh, too much swearing. If I play a, a song, a copyrighted song, I don't do that though. It's usually swearing. Um, I'm more careful about praising Garth on screen, but sometimes that used to do it. So, yeah, I've done the T-Wow sample chapter of Theon where Stannis is. Yeah, I've read that one. That's in the playlist. And uh, check out Grey Waste Tim's channel if you haven't. And uh, yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> if Bebe says peg too much. No, nah, there's not too much. Yeah, we're all adults here. So John's dance chapters are actually what I really want to read. His dance chapters are incredible. I guess, yeah, we do get some Stannis in John's chapters. Maybe that's the way to do it. John's dance chapters, there's just so much. There's so much in every one of them. So, all right, guys. No, I'm actually not talking about Winds of Winter. I've got a Winds of Winter predictions playlist, but in the Hall of Fame reread playlist, that's got all the chapter rereads like this one. And uh, that's where you will find the thing we were just talking about. Which one was it? Ah, the Winds of Winter. I read all the Winds of Winter sample chapters. They're in that list. Read the whole chapter. So. All right, guys, take care. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you with a new video this week.